Section 25 of Bethlehem by Frederick William Faber. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Calvary Before Its Time, Part 2. Egypt is not less fertile than the desert in images of beauty. What are these white walls, which are laved by the flood when it is out, but otherwise rise out of that luxuriant green flat of densest herbage, sward so inveterately green that it seems proof almost against the scorching of the Egyptian sun? It is Heliopolis. We will enter on the evening of its pagan holy day. All the morning there have been endless sacrifices, all the day there have been crowds of worshippers, the streets are full of people, the evening star will rise upon the grave riot of an Egyptian festival. Towards sunset there is a pause in the streets, the multitudes stand still. It is as if a mighty city had been paralysed by some dreadful shock. A fearful, dubious rumour has gone forth, stilling all the noisy populace, so that men could hear each other's hearts beating. A moment's pause, the multitude sways uncertainly like a huge tree in the first blast of the tempest, and then rolls onward to the temples, in waves and waves of men pressing upon each other as billow chases billow up the sand. As the sun was sloping, while the lanterns were just being lit, while the incense were smoking tranquilly before the idols, and the sacred doves were settling themselves to roost in the plane trees of the outer courts, the images of the gods fell without warning from their bases with a hideous crash, and are lying mutilated and in fragments on the ground. Not a tremor of earthquake could be felt. The marble pavements have not given, nor one slab been raised. The air was so still, there was hardly a breath to set a broad plain leaf turning on its little unwieldy pivot. What omen is this, what fearful unlooked-for anger of the sun? Meanwhile, some pilgrims are entering the city gate unnoticed. Who would notice pilgrims on such a night as that, when every town of Egypt, the ports at the Nile mouths, the dwellers above the cataracts, even the peasants from the distant oases, had gathered to the sanctuary of the sun? Through streets, silent, vacant, in the rear of the multitudes that have rushed to the temples, Mary, clasping to her bosom her slumbering child, follows Joseph faintly and wearily to the Khan to find a corner amidst its crowded inmates, or to find all places full, the old experience of Bethlehem. The streets of Heliopolis come before us on a later day, Mary as carrying the infant in her arms. It is a many-coloured scene. Crowds are moving to and fro, buying and selling, in parties or alone. Every one, it should seem, must be intent upon his own occupations. Strangers are no strange thing. Sanctuaries and pilgrimage places are hardened to the sight of strangers. Yet somehow that Jewish mother and her child draw all eyes upon them. Everyone looks up and follows them with his look, as long as they are in sight. It is something more than beauty which overflows the countenance of the child. There is an attraction in him which will not give an account of itself. He is like a light in a dark place, an apparition that fascinates the beholders and awakens deep, nameless emotions in the heart, which are akin to worship and religion. The dark eyes of those bronzed faces cast wild looks upon the glorious child. There is something in them which makes the mother tremble instinctively. She has no superstition of the evil eye, but she looks onward to another crowd in another place, to other wild eyes cast yet more wildly upon her love, upon a far darker day than these days of exile. She folds him to her bosom, as if they were going to rob her of him, when it is truly, and she knows it, only the fierceness of their admiration which so lights up their swarthy features. He also seems to feel the presence of that pagan multitude, and in some way to resent that which causes his mother fear. He gazes on the people unblenchingly, as if it were in the bold simplicity of infancy, not without deep love, yet with something flashing king-like in his air. He even stirs in her arms uneasily, as if he would defend her and take her part against that multitude. His face is set like that of a young eagle in a storm, beating up against the channels of the wind, another sort of beauty from that which he will wear when he is driven to and fro like a hunted thing by the maddened populace of Jerusalem. 
The Egyptian city rises up before us again with its narrow streets, its quaint bazaars, and the menageries of its multitudinous temples. It is now indeed, as its name imports, the city of the sun, for the true sun is there, and the place looks darker for his shining. Over the hot Nile valley, antiquity broods like a cloud. The old fortunes of the people of God rest there like a shadow. The ancient plagues of the unbelieving king still seem to load the air. The river is as silent as a river in a dream. There is an atmosphere of fate over the picture. The bright lights seem burdened with something which is not bright. In an alley of high walls near the city gate, in a dim street with buildings so tall that the sun lights it only in its meridian transit, is Joseph's dwelling of poverty and exile. The implements of work lie round about. But there is a pause. Mary has suspended her spinning. Joseph holds in his hand the piece of wood he was fitting to another. Their eyes are fixed upon the child who is on his feet upon the ground, but clinging to the lap of Mary's garment. Of himself, unpersuaded, unexpected, without a pattern sedulously given him to mimic, he has spoken his first word. Perhaps it was the name of God, perhaps his mother's name. Because he was himself God, skillful in the craft of love, exquisitely considerate in the inventions of compassions, we will deem it was his mother's name. Look at the eyes of the mother and the foster father. An earthquake might rend Heliopolis in twain, and they would not hear or feel. The glow of ecstasy, puzzled but not disquieted, is on their features. The word the father spoke eternally has now spoken himself. Who would dare to think that even Mary taught the word to speak? The cloud of silence broke suddenly from before his mind, as from off a mountain top, and the little house at Heliopolis was flooded with refulgence. The very sound gave light. The very light played music. The ears of those two had heard the midnight gloria of the angelic choirs, but it had no such melody as this. It well nigh called their souls out of their bodies, it was so wonderful. To that picture we listen rather than look. It has passed away. Evening has come down upon the land, the brief evening. The Nile glows like a glossy creature, swift, broad-backed, and almost noiseless in the crimson sunset. Only at the edge the quick waters make the reeds twitter a little, except in the little earthy bays where the lotus lily rises and falls at anchor quietly, just tremulously enough to shake its odors out upon the air, like incense from the thurible. The incarnate god is musing on the bank, Mary withdrawn a stone's throw from him as if she had felt it was his will, and yet withdrawn less far than the apostles at Gethsemane. Her gaze is as fixed upon him as an angel's look is fixed upon the vision. His mind opens before us as if a sanctuary were being unveiled, and it flows out of his eyes as if they are bent upon the stream and catch the reflection of the golden light from the shining waters. In the scarce audible murmur of the river he hears the cry that rang through Egypt in the night, that terrible night of the firstborn. It is as if the echoes of that wail had been undulating over the desert ever since. The tears gather in his eyes, for he thinks of Bethlehem, its mothers, and its innocence. But he hears now in the stillness, while the evening breeze scarce waves its indolent pinions over the sun-shriveled land, the trampling of countless hurrying feet. It is the children of Israel going forth in the darkness upon their exodus, and there is the exodus of a whole world to be accomplished now, and it is he who must cleave the sea, and how shall it be cloven? The twilight deepens. Almost suddenly it is dark. The eyes of the child have gone out in the darkness, and the wind rises and the mist gathers on the stream. Once more we see him in the early dawn passing through the gates of Heliopolis after Joseph's dream. The freshness of the morning is on the Nile. The sails of the boats catch the sun above the high banks of the river. In the faces of all the three there is a sense of freedom after imprisonment. The brightness of a return from exile breathes in every feature. The careworn look is gone. The step is elastic. It is morning in their souls as well as morning on the outside earth. They are like those who have had a recent message from heaven. They have a glory round them like wreaths of angels manifest. The pagan faces have been a grief to Joseph, 
they were a dread to Mary. They breathe more freely now that they are out of the city of those dark men, and away from the strange closeness of the dim bazaars and many latticed walls. They are now like the singing birds of the woods and fields, free and living on the providence of their heavenly Father, to find food on all roadsides, and to drink of the brook in the way, and to sing that perpetual voiceless song which a quiet heart is always singing in the ear of God. But there is something more in the boy of seven years old. The growth of his humanity seems to betray the divinity more and more, as if it had more room to display itself, and anticipated each new human gesture, and made it all divine. The light in his clear eyes is deep, and in their depths are mysteries. Jerusalem is in his heart. There is a desolate green hill outside its gates, which is a magnet to his soul. There is the same wonderful look upon his boyish face, which amazed the apostles so much in him when he hurried along the road to Jerusalem, as if to be in time for his passion, as if it might else elude his thirst for suffering. That look upon his face is printed now on Mary's heart, and overflows her face as well. Those two faces belong to Calvary. Upon the face of Joseph there still rests the old tranquillity of Bethlehem. Nazareth also contributes to this land of the sacred infancy many fair scenes. In truth, a complete pictured theology of the Incarnation. We often come near to rest in life and then are cheated of it, and after that we reach a better rest through disappointment, better because it was not our own choice, and better as it proves in its very self. Such seems to be the significance of that holy calm which shines on the features of Mary and Joseph as they draw nigh to Nazareth after they have been disappointed in their desire of dwelling at Jerusalem. I should not say disappointed, for there are no disappointments to those whose wills are buried in the will of God. With the boy also Jerusalem is to be delayed. Yet on his face there is the same intense tranquillity as if the coming rest sent its peace before it into soul and countenance. All three wear the look we might expect to see on the faces of those who are first entering heaven. There is no trouble, no surprise, no voice, no jubilee, but a flush of peace arising from the intensity of joy kept down and deepened by the nearness to God and the momentarily expected vision. Even to those whose souls are God's sanctuary on earth, Nazareth is itself a sanctuary to be approached with awful memories. It is the dread scene of the Incarnation, and now it is to be the home of Jesus for many uneventful years, whose uneventfulness, if we could read it rightly, is the most eventful page in all creation's history. Its glory now consists in its being the harbour of the boy and the witness of continual hidden wonders. For eighteen years each day, which to us seems to have been but one brief waving of time's soundless wing, will teem with wonders inexhaustible even by angelical intelligence. Quiet, sequestered Nazareth, which the green hills sentinel so pleasantly, how didst thou suck in those three tempest-tossed souls as the harbour draws in the ships with the setting of the tide? Look upon those faces. Calvary seems further off than ever now yet there is something which speaks of it in the eye. It is not forgotten, it is only waiting. In Mary there is a look of reprieve. In Jesus it is steadfast calm and a certainty which needs not to be precipitate. Joseph has the air of age musing contentedly on the pleasant place which it has chosen for its burial. Altogether a complicated contentment is the ruling genius of the picture. Then, the interior of the holy house, comes before us. We behold the outer chamber of the house and Joseph's shop, and the green swelling hills are seen through the open doorway. Mary is seated in the doorway, spinning, though at that moment her work is arrested, and Jesus is near her, looking fixedly at some doves that are feeding in front of the door. The mother is gazing upon her son in astonishment, Yet it is an astonishment which is passing rapidly into adoration, and every moment we expect to see her at his feet. She does not know exactly why this is. Yet it is not new there. There have been times like this before, times when his apparent growth in wisdom and grace have dawned upon her, and come home to her, through some look or gesture seemingly trivial in itself. 
It is just as with mothers whose eyes, however love may quicken them, do not see their children grow, but who wake up now and then to the fact that they are grown, and that some sweet interesting change has taken place in them. It is the hour of one of these heavenly surprises now. Mary looks as we might fancy an angel would look, who has been gazing on the beatific vision these thousand years, and now for the first time sees something new in God, which yet was always there. The creature, rather than the mother, is working in her features. Let the scene change to the inner room where Jesus sleeps. It is just after the return from Egypt. Mary has helped him to undress and has arranged him in his bed. Her face glows with a loving familiarity, as if the very offices in which her fingers had been engaged made her heart more free. He has been forward in his caresses, those caresses which become more touching to a mother when childhood is passing into boyhood, as if they were of more value because they are more conscious and deliberate, and perhaps more rare. Her heart is overflowing with an earthly mother's love, yet there is some contradictory look in her eye, something which controls love but does not lessen it. It is not as if she had for one moment forgotten, or as if she otherwise than calmly realized her son's divinity, but it is as if love and worship were not always like two rivers blending in an inland lake, but as if they sometimes alternated in quiet waveless tides, as if in a landlocked bay far up in the embrace of mighty hills, yet whither the sea travels with his ebb and flow. She looks less the creature and more the mother now. There are many pictures also which remain to this day in heaven, painted upon the unforgetting intelligences of the angels, of which the scene was Joseph's shop. The common litter of a carpenter's working place is there. Boards propped up against the walls, pieces of wood lying over each other in all shapes and at all angles, the floor strewn with chips and straight lines of sawdust, under the place where he has been sawing, various tools mingling in the apparent confusion, and mutilated implements of agriculture lying outside the door. This is the scene which presents itself, and Mary is standing in the doorway of the house hard by. Joseph is showing Jesus how to do some work, and his broad man's hand is laid on the small hand of the boy, and is gently guiding his fingers. He is doing it mechanically, for he is gazing rather on the Saviour's face than on the work. He sees the boy all resplendent with glory, and his faith recognizes in him the omnipotent creator, the eternal worker, who so deftly fashioned the countless worlds, and whose fingers he, the aged carpenter, is now venturing to press, to guide, and to manipulate as he wills. The old man's soul overflows with adoration, but tranquilly, without wave or sound, as if fed by silent springs from underneath. Nevertheless, he does not desist from guiding the hand of Jesus. He does not interrupt the lesson which he knows to be so little needed. He is too humble for that. He understands his office. It was incomprehensible to him always from the first. The exercise of his authority could never be otherwise to him than the exercise of a sublime obedience. Then, as his soul swells with adoration, self-objection falls over his features like a veil of light. As the sun breaks the clouds and unrolls his splendor downwards from the brow of the hill to the vale beneath, his humility so clothes him with majesty that he looks almost godlike, and his age is transfigured into a semblance of eternity. As he is older now and stronger, the water pitcher is not too great a weight for the creator of the world, yet it bows him forward and makes him tread with a different step as he climbs up that grassy path with his burden. Many are coming and going from the well, all have a word to say to Mary's son, and he answers, sometimes with a word, more often with his eye. All are contented. He is a silent boy, but there is something in his presence in that little town like the sun in heaven, whose shining and obscurity make more difference to man and beast and herb than words can tell. Women with their pitchers upon their heads stop and turn and gaze upon him, and then sigh with envy at Mary's lot contrasting it with secret sorrows of their own in which their sons bear mournful part. The rough manners of the Nazarenes soften when the sunbeam of his smile is on them. 
cold hearts warm and hard hearts grow gentle and anger dies away and all are divinely unmanned as he comes among them. He is already a king, a little king of men's hearts crowned in the love and loyalty of the most boorish village in all Syria. They have crowned the boy, but they will uncrown the man when his royalty becomes a serious thing. He knows this already. He looks at them with more than sorrow, with more than love, with an indescribable yearning which attunes all his features. They have made him king, but for their sakes he is rather longing to be priest. The water, as it gurgles in the pitcher, is like a heavenly temptation to him. His thoughts are onward upon Jacob's well and the woman of Samaria. His thoughts are over all the world in countless Christian fonts. The blood in those veins must mingle with the water in that pitcher before it will cleanse the sins of Nazareth away. The thought is an ever-present one with him, yet his heart leaps up now as if it were new, and the face of the boy broadens into the countenance of the man of Calvary, and, almost mastering the characteristic sweetness of his youth, is clothed as with a fire in the mature beauty of the Redeemer. But is Jerusalem nowhere in the landscapes of the sacred infancy? Let us go back to the day when the fortieth sun rose upon the newborn babe. The early dawn had seen Mary and Joseph wending their way from Bethlehem to the holy city. It was the clear cold of a bright spring morning. The dewdrops glistened like diamonds on the grass, and the palms as they waved flung off their harmless crystal showers on the passers-by. Jesus lay, a seemingly unconscious infant, now in his mother's arms and now in Joseph's. White in the morning light were the terraces and towers and temple roofs of magnificent Jerusalem, growing like a natural growth from the dark edges of its steep ravines. He looked upon it all from out the envelopment of his swaddling clothes, as a bird looks on a human face from the leafy covert which fringes and conceals its nest. The passion is in his eyes. The very separate scenes of that terrific drama may be read there, even when in their liquid lustres the buildings of Jerusalem were mirroring themselves with soft impression. It was as if in the grandeur of a heavenly vision some glorious poet or mighty warrior or high-souled statesman were allowed to see that sublime thing for which he was born, that worldwide work for which he was to live, that grand end for which all life was to be but scanty measure. There would be much in such a vision to terrify, but the sublimity of terror is the increase of courage to noble souls, and how superb would be their look as they gazed on the bravery of their success, yet saw meanwhile that by the universal law their greatness must be their martyrdom. Yet such was only the groundwork of the light that shone in those infantine eyes. It was only the human element which beautifully ranged and reconciled itself there with the divine. It was the invisible soul become visible in the swaddling clothes. The body had almost disappeared, effaced by that deluge of inward light. The mother goes up to sacrifice. Let us follow her to the temple, for never before was sacrifice like to this. It is the interior of the temple. A strong light falls upon the central figures. The others are lost in the very indistinctness which the contrast of the strong light causes. Simeon and Anna and a group of holy souls, we know that they are there, but they are only shadows, broken outlines. They take up no room in our eye. Joseph is the silent presence of the Eternal Father, witnessing, ratifying, accepting, overshadowing the sacrifice. In this mystery, Joseph is rather part of heaven than of earth. He is more a symbol than an actor. He fulfills his office as shadow of the everlasting there is Mary and the child and the priest. This last seems rather to be a type of priesthood than an individual priest. His lineaments are manifestly ideal. He is the representative shadow of invisible and sacerdotal power. So much of Joseph's office he usurps for the time, while Joseph is intent upon that higher one. His very garments are embroidered allegories. He is not a human figure. Mary is giving away her child and putting him into the arms of the priest. The spirit of sacrifice is going from her countenance like rays of light. She seems to rise into the air and to widen with majestic grace into colossal dimensions. 
The mother's heart shines through the magnificence of the glorified heroine, not as if it were outshone, but as if its light were magnified by the other radiance through which it shines. There is no struggle. Her will does not resist the will of God, yet neither is it overlaid or effaced by the divine will. It is present, it is unquenched, its pathos is inimitable. But it is subject, subject with the most free and meritorious subjection, seen through the transparent will of God, which never oppresses the glories it overrules. Victims have a beauty of their own, a beauty not the less touching because it is for the most part dumb. The poor sheep is glorified in the eyes of art not so much by the garland of flowers that hangs about its neck as by the circumstances round it, the priest, the temple, the sacrificial knife. But the beauty of this victim, the glory of this mute infant, is all his own. In his eyes, which look so many volumes in each single glance, we read his perfect knowledge of the unutterable justice of God and the all-holy greediness of its requirements. His mother is lifting him into it as into the mouth of a devouring fire. But his soul is on fire already with the promptitude of his own human will, and it almost outglows the furnace of that eternal will which is opening to receive its victim. Love yearns more to be sacrificed than justice to consume the sacrifice. We remember another scene far off. It was when the sun hung upon the cross and put his mother away from him that he might be poor with the perfection of poverty. He had given himself to his father and could not offer himself again, and so he offered his mother in his stead. It was a scene of cruelest magnificence. He was the sacrificer there and she the victim. They had simply changed places. This picture in the temple was the opposite of that on Calvary. She was the sacrificer here, and he the victim. Yet was he not also, and especially, the victim on Calvary? How marvellously all mysteries are one mystery because they are divine. End of section 25section 26 of bethlehem by frederick william faber this librivox recording is in the public domain calvary before its time part 3 12 years are gone and the boy kneels as a worshipper in the temple his single kneeling figure is all we picture to ourselves but alas where are the words to say what it is we see is it all the realm of angels with the manifold beauty of their choirs, expressive in ten thousand diversities of the almost infinite spirit of adoration? Is it the beauty of all heaven caught up by God and cast into one point of exceeding light and then doubled in the eyes of Jesus? No, that is not all. Is it then the beauty of all holy hearts throughout the earth and the earth's ages, worshipping their heavenly Father in their gladness, in their sorrow, in their pensiveness, in the fortitude of their humility, under all the never-repeated variety of their pathetic circumstances? Are all hearts worshipping in that heart, and all the world's worship working in that radiant countenance? No, there is also more than that. There is the indescribable fullness, the unimaginable repose of the worship of the sacred humanity, encompassing the majesty of God, enveloping each and all of his lightning-like attributes and bearing on itself, as the great tidal wave bears the sun-struck foam upon its crest, all the worship of angels and of men up to the foot of the eternal throne, ever rising, ever falling, ever giving light, like the spray in the dark night-time upon the eternal shore. Let us look again. It is two hours past noon, and there is a gathering of the pilgrims at the gate of Jerusalem, through which the road goes northward. Joseph and the band of men are together, and Mary and the band of women. The two companies will travel separate till nightfall. There is something of the picturesqueness of an encampment about the meeting place, and the faces are all fresh, and seem to witness to the soul being in a state of grace after the spiritual renewal of the feast. Between the two bands the boy Jesus passes like a wandering sunbeam, with less of notice than we have ever seen him receive in any other picture. He withdraws and is not missed. There is a spell on Mary's heart, the viewless band over Joseph's eyes. He stands in the shadow of the gate and sees the company of women start. 
to be followed in another hour and by a different route by the troop of men. The boy clings to the city as if it were his mother, as if those rugged ravines were the very skirts of her garment. O Jerusalem, and thou wert such a mother. The vision of the holy city as he saw it that February morning twelve years ago is graven on his soul. He saw it by the Nile bank. He came home from exile with it in his heart. He drew near to it, and Joseph was warned in a dream to take him from it. He will wean himself now from Mary and from Nazareth, or at least will seem as if he were bent on doing so, for his doings are unfathomable just now. No one yet has sounded them or unriddled their significance. Hereafter the tempter from a mountain top shall show him all the kingdoms of the earth, their pageants and their treasures, and his eye shall wander coldly over them from the summit of Quarantana. His covetousness is of an exclusive sort. Sufferings and souls are the only treasures that he craves. But the vision of Jerusalem, its stones to his prophetic eye already stained with blood, its streets ringing with the furious acclaim which met Pilate's appeal to the popular compassion, the crisp rustling of the old olive trees in the neighboring Gethsemane, the bones whitening in the sun on the pale turf of Calvary. This was a more tempting sight than that from Quarantana. It drew him from Mary's side, for a tridor, at least like the tridor of his passion, he will beg his bread, a heavenly mendicant, in the streets of Zion, and lay his delicate limbs on the rude pavement. He will have the very stones, which he will one day mark with his precious blood, leave their marks now on his yielding flesh. Yet as he stands in the shadow of the gateway, his eye follows his mother's figure till it disappears, and there are many things which seem contrary, yet not conflicting, eloquently speaking out of those eyes, whose language is more easily to be read because their brilliance is softened in the gateway's shade. Once more we see him in the temple. He is in the hall of the doctors, the school of theology. The gravest men in Israel are gathered round him. Almost every form of wonder is depicted on their faces, while their limbs are perfect studies because of the various ways in which their attitudes express the intensity of their attention. Angry wonder blends with sweet surprise, and zeal that needs but the spark to fire its train mingles with the only half-intelligent delight which illuminates the features of some of the aged men. But on many faces there is the beginning of a look which can darken some day into the darkness of an awful cruelty. The door of the hall is half open, and Mary and Joseph stand there, not amazed, not petrified into statues, but in unspeakable repose, as if they had had to journey to the world's end, and had got there now, and there was nothing more to do, and no further to be gone, for they had come to him who was the end of all worlds. As to himself, never was the bashfulness of his boyhood more obviously, more winningly displayed than now, when the Creator was sounding the intelligences of his creatures and sprinkling them with a shower of his own celestial wisdom. He was asking questions, who was in himself the sole sufficient answer to all questions that could be asked. He was seeming to learn in order that he might more sweetly teach, He was blamelessly deceiving that the seers of Israel might behold the truth. More and more he grew like a boy, as more and more the light of the Godhead within him was burning away the thin veils of flesh and blood. Surely in another moment he will bloom into confessed, undoubted God, and the life will be scared out of their stricken souls. The angels remember him as he was at that astonishing moment, to Mary's love and Joseph's faith manifest God, to the others, a wonder, a portent, an enigma, a suspicion, yet to all of them, a not unchildlike child. Words indeed have golden pencils, but there are unexplored regions of the sacred infancy which no limning of language can portray. The act of the incarnation under the overshadowing of the Holy Ghost is practically as hidden from us as the generation of the sun up in the inaccessible sources of eternal light. The nine months' life in the bosom of his mother, evidenced outwardly by Mary's haste and by the sweetness of her song, by Elizabeth's salutation and the jubilee of the Baptist, redeemed before his birth, was a succession of spiritual pictures which we cannot imagine, 
but of which it is no mean knowledge to know that such things were. When we regard him also, wherever he was during those twelve years, as the center of the world's government, environed by multitudes of angels, giving laws to all the phenomena of nature, shedding power and life and endurance into all things, holding them up above the hungry abyss of nothingness, which is ever threatening to engulf all finite things, playing upon the manifold strings of his immense providence, and encircling every existence in the universe with the warm, clasping ring of his creative love, we see indistinctly into another vast region of which we can discern nothing but its vastness, while our instincts testify to the necessity of its being also extremely beautiful. His soul, too, had a spiritual scenery of its own, which nothing but his own light could by some supernatural process transfer to our intelligences. Much also, from time to time, reveals itself to the meditative eye, out of the operations of grace in the souls of Mary and Joseph from contact with him. This also belongs to the sacred infancy and throws light upon its marvellous creations. But these are unexplored regions on the one hand not to be attempted, on the other hand not to be forgotten. But one thing is true of all these pictures. The shadow of Calvary rests upon them all. Everywhere the sunlight is intercepted. There is not one patch in one landscape on which the unimpeded sun may sleep, as on a bank of flowers. The shadow is universal. Denser here and thinner there, it is unequal, but it is ubiquitous. The passion is the unity of the infancy. Calvary gives its character to Bethlehem. It is strangely gifted for a shadow, for it makes both the light and shade of all the pictures. It withdraws from the eye what it would have us see but indistinctly. It thrusts darkly on our notice what it would not have us fail to see. It is the atmosphere of the infancy impressing its peculiarity on the scenery. It becomes familiar to us, intelligible to us, dear to us, by the colourless medium of that soft shading. But it was not merely an outward thing, a haziness hung upon the hills, a twilight sent to mellow, a memory that usurps an empire over the eye, or a foresight that tinges the imagination. Calvary was the real inward life of the sacred heart in the infancy. It was more the babe's home than Bethlehem. There was indeed an underground world of ecstatic joys beneath the sorrow, but it was jealously hidden like a divine thing which is meant to transpire rather than to be seen. Neither was the shadow on himself only, but on all around him. It transfused itself into the heart of Mary, for how could she see by a different light from that with which he saw? It penetrated into the heart of Joseph. The venerable Jane of the Cross tells us that Joseph was allowed to feel all the pains of the Passion in a mystical way, as some of the saints have done. But the shadow stole everywhere, just as the twilight creeps noiselessly into evening's sunniest nooks, and quietly masters all the land without the winnowing of its silken wing being heard or seen. Everywhere there was shadow, and it was one shadow— the shade cast by Calvary, a low hill indeed, but tall enough to cast a shadow that should gird the globe and come round to rest on the same dear height from which it had been thrown. The sacred infancy may almost be defined to be the passion in repose. There is indeed at first sight an apparent contrast between Bethlehem and Calvary, between the crib and the cross. Neither can we truly say that it is only apparent. No two mysteries of our Lord are exactly alike. They are full of analogies. A unity of spirit reigns over them all, yet no one is the mere double of another, or the repetition of it under different picturesque circumstances. Nevertheless, the apparent contrast between the crib and the cross is much stronger than the real difference. The region of Bethlehem seems to be the abode of almost perpetual calm. There is the placid littleness of the infant, there is the gentleness of the meditative Joseph, there are the maternal joys of Mary too deep for utterance. There is beauty, sweetness, softness, something attractive to the genius and eye of art. This is all broken up by the storms of Calvary, and Joseph has disappeared. In the world of the infancy we have almost total seclusion from men. 
In the world of the Passion, Jesus is the central figure and suffering victim of a wild and infuriate multitude. In Bethlehem, and up to the city gate at twelve years of age, we behold Mary's unbroken jurisdiction over him. One of the sorrows of Calvary is her inability to help him, or even to minister to the thirsting sufferer, the ministries of a common charity, to say nothing of the offices of maternal love. Seemingly, at least, there is in the crib an absence of bodily pain, while the cross and the antecedents of the cross are remarkable for an unutterable excess of it. In the times of the infancy, those who loved him were always with him, and when he had to fly, it was those he loved who fled with him. In the times of Calvary, those he loved abandoned him, until at last, after he had given away to Mary that sweet apostle who was her second Joseph, his solitude became without a parallel for he himself had put his mother from him, and the Eternal Father had forsaken him. When the infancy and boyhood came to a close, miraculous manifestations of the divine complacency preluded to the opening of his ministry, as he came up out of the waters of Jordan, whereas the very last step in his passion was the agony of a divine dereliction. These things make a strong contrast between the crib and the cross, and they are surely more than mere appearances, more than simple varieties of scenery. Nevertheless, in spite of this indubitable contrast, there is a real inward identity between the two. In the soul of Jesus, prevision was not simply a great gift of prophecy. What we learned of his science in the last chapter will show us that there was a reality in his prevision of the passion which made it a substantial passion already. The bodily pains were anticipated with a vividness which, if it did not rack muscle, nerve and flesh as the reality was to do, at least transferred a proportionate agony of fear and trembling and natural horror to his shrinking soul. While the spiritual tortures of the passion were not so much foreseen at Bethlehem as actually begun, inasmuch as they had not to be learned and could not be aggravated by any new occurrences, there was not reason why they should not be felt from the first moment of his conception. Indeed, some contemplatives tell us that Jesus sweated blood repeatedly during his infancy. Moreover, Calvary presided over Bethlehem. The mysteries of the cross exercised an acknowledged sovereignty over the mysteries of the crib. These last were not ends. They were roads which had to be travelled, things which happened on the road, landscapes seen from it. They had no direct share in the accomplishment of the great work of redemption. Blood was to be shed, shed till it was all shed, shed until life oozed out with it, and the sacred union of body and soul was dissolved. This followed from the change which sin superinduced upon the first idea of the Incarnation. Had the word come in a purely glorious Incarnation, an Incarnation which was to crown creation, and had no redemption to effect, Perhaps the act of his incarnation and his beginnings of a created life among his creatures might have seemed more wonderful to the eyes of men than the triumphal ascension with which his appointed years would have concluded, an ascension which would not then have been reached through any gates of death. Death would have been but a phenomenon of the animal kingdom, unknown to immortal men. But now the eyes and hearts of men will gather where their hopes are around the dim scene of Calvary, and the sacrificial horrors of the cross. Yet even now, the operation of God is more manifest in the mysteries of Bethlehem, and the operation of man in the mysteries of Calvary. In the one God works, in the other he suffers. In both he is active, and in both he is passive, yet, if we may venture to say so, we see more of his activity in Bethlehem, and more of his passiveness on Calvary. Bethlehem is what the Creator does to his creatures, Calvary is what his creatures do to him. The will of the child was the same as the will of the man. The will in Bethlehem was identical with the will on Calvary. There was the same intense desire of suffering with the same deep dread of it. There was the same weight of sin torturing his sensibility with its cruel load. There was the same anger of the father to be endured, perceived with the same clearness, apprehended with the same fullness of science, an ungrowing anger which would not increase with the years of Jesus, and which did not require the cooperation of human cruelty in order to make itself felt within his soul. His mother, in whose life he lived the dearest part of his own life, was already the mother of dollars. 
though as yet she had not stood on Calvary. Her nine months of expectation had not been unchecked gladness. The immensity of her science and the light which to her glowed perpetually on the page of Scripture alike forbade it. Her forty days of peace at Bethlehem had their shades of sorrow which, although they were shortly to be deepened, were still palpable shadows. But since the prophecy of St. Simeon, the seven swords had been planted in her bosom, and they could never be drawn out now for eight and forty years, almost half a century, for if they were drawn out she would bleed to death. In both the mother and the son the dispositions of sacrifice and oblation were absolutely the same. Inwardly, therefore, there was complete identity between the crib and the cross. It only needed act to transfigure Bethlehem into Calvary. There was even much outward analogy between the two. The Bethlehemites rejected him in the person of his mother, as the Jews afterwards rejected him in his own. He had scarcely made himself visible on earth when he had to fly from his own creatures, because his life was deemed incompatible with their interests, just as in his passion his death was pronounced by the spiritual authorities of the nation to be expedient for the people. No one can meditate on the mystery of the presentation without being often reminded of Palm Sunday. His infancy had there its one brief triumph before the face of the babe was snatched away and hidden in the solitudes of the wilderness and amid the crowds of Egyptian idolaters. Anna bore him witness, and Simeon sang him a song of triumph, as meek and childlike as his own infantine sweetness. It was in the same temple where the little children in later years cried Hosanna after him, giving tongues, as he implied, to the very inanimate stones that were almost breaking forth to praise him. If from the hilltop, on the road from Bethany, he saw them mourning on Jerusalem, and shared his memorable tears, May we not suppose also that his infant eyes were suffused with the tears of manifold emotions when he saw Jerusalem from his mother's arms that February morning? From the coasts of Egypt he drew near to Jerusalem, but under Joseph's authority he turned aside. It was not time. So afterwards did he hide himself when the others were going up to Jerusalem. He would not go up yet because all was not ready. To the mystery of the circumcision his sacred infancy owed its privilege of shedding blood, which is almost its most striking analogy with the passion. On Calvary he involved all near him in the darkness and anguish of his sufferings. Mary was steeped in woe, Magdalene and John were broken-hearted. The poor fugitive apostles were overwhelmed with darkness and with the bitterness of love, self-disappointed and self-ashamed. Peter was even driven to deny him. Persecution awaited all, it was the same in his infancy. At that time he involved in all his sufferings his blessed mother, his aged foster father, and even a helpless multitude of slaughtered innocents. A dark, bright ring of suffering lay wide around him, wherever he moved, like a halo round the moon. It is so even now, it will be so to the end. The vicinity of Jesus is a privilege of delighted grace for which nature has to pay dearly. In the Taridur of the Passion, he was separated from Mary three days. It was a like Taridur, marked by the same separation which brought the infancy to a close. The resurrection followed the former Taridur, and the eighteen years of hidden Nazareth, which followed the latter Taridur, are full of analogies with the forty days after the resurrection, in many ways besides their hiddenness. Thus even the outward analogies between Bethlehem and Calvary are neither few in number nor insignificant in their mystery. In the light of theology and in the fire of devotion, Bethlehem and Calvary are continually blending into one. There is no more strongly marked peculiarity of theology than the way in which it unites distant truths, harmonizes remote mysteries, and identifies things which in matters less divine would seem irreconcilable, if not contradictory. In the doctrine of our Lord's divine person we see how Bethlehem and Calvary were one to him to whom time can bring nothing, and to whom the three and thirty years were but as a golden point, which to us, when it is beaten out and far from beaten thin, can cover the whole world with its magnificence of manifold mystery. 
the immense science of his human soul and his full use of reason from the moment of his conception remove from his sacred infancy all those imperfections which seem at first sight incompatible with his prevision and anticipated experience of the passion. What we know of the exquisite sensibilities and delicate perfections of his humanity relieves us from all suspicion of exaggeration even when we look at Bethlehem in our own minds as an unbroken Gethsemane. The doctrine of his ungrowing grace secures for us the fixity of his interior dispositions, by which mainly it is that Calvary is so imperceptibly and inseparably dovetailed into Bethlehem. The most probable opinions about Mary's science already invest her amply in the mantle of her dollars, and so her science involving her heart in the darkness of the great tragedy, his heart is involved with hers. The two hearts beat in each other and cannot beat otherwise. The two lives of the mother and the son cannot be disentangled without many an unseemly rent in the sacred vesture of theology. Moreover, the doctrine of his use of reason makes the infancy already a passion of itself, with a peculiar tragedy of its own distinct from that of Calvary, for it had pains and perils, sufferings and penances belonging to itself, and these, which to a common infant, would have had all the imperfect consciousness, unanticipated occurrence, rapid transition and speedy oblivion common to childhood, were to him, with his full use of reason, perfect grown-up sufferings, with the additional uneasiness of physical infirmity and voluntary speechlessness and all the self-imposed disguise of infancy. But if the crib and the cross so blend in the light of theology they are completely fused together in the fires of devotion, they both produce the same spirit in the soul, though they produce it variously. The spirit of Bethlehem is one of contrition, of mortification and of expiatory reparation, and of the same sort is the spirit of Calvary. It is as natural for devotion to weep by the manger as it is to weep by the cross. Thus, in all the saints and holy persons who have had a special attraction to the sacred infancy, it has been a pensive, pathetic devotion. It breathes the same lowliness as Calvary. There is the same fragrance of self-objection. It drives the sense of sin as deeply into the softened heart as the scene which the moonlight of Gethsemane discloses. The child crucified and the crucified man on his mother's lap are the echoes of each other, soundless echoes seen rather than heard by the eye of piety. The love caused by both mysteries is the same. It is the love of exceeding pathos, not like the love of the resurrection or of the hidden years at Nazareth. Even the very differences of Bethlehem and Calvary reach the same end, though it be by opposite roads. They go round the world, one by the east, the other by the west. They exhibit him crucified, and they produce an inward crucifixion in the soul. They both land us in an abnegation of ourselves. They both regenerate us in a mystical childhood. Both are ways of tears, both are gateways through which only littleness can enter. Both envelop us with the spirit of Jesus and unclothe us of all that is vile and ignoble in our own. They both express themselves in the same outward symbolical reality, speaking the same language at the same moment in one awful and indivisible voice, in the Mass and the Blessed Sacrament. End of section 26《セクション27of Bethlehem by Frederick William Faber》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Calvary Before Its Time, Part 4 But we must go somewhat more into detail with the sufferings of the sacred infancy. They may be divided into four classes, its outward penances, its inward penances, its states of life and the peculiar virtues it was called upon to exercise. Its outward penances were its least, yet they form a darksome lot for the first years and helpless tenderness of the infant God. The babe of Bethlehem shed many tears, and they flowed from manifold sources of bitterness deep down within his soul. They came from heart sorrows, such as were portions of his inward penances. 
but they came also perhaps, for who shall limit his condescensions from pain and feebleness, from inconveniences and wretchedness, which his extreme sensibility did not exaggerate to him, but enabled him alone of babes born of women to feel in their uttermost reality. Pain which seems the same is in reality not the same to any two sufferers. Its painfulness is varied by the delicacy and susceptibility, by the illness or the soft-heartedness, and even by the momentary circumstances, still more by the inward consciousness of him who suffers. Now not only was there never one whose humanity was so finely fashioned, so unspeakably susceptible as our blessed Lord's, and therefore never one to whom any pain was so intensely painful as the very pain was to him, but also there was never one whose inward feelings, self-consciousness or rather self-possession, made corporal pain so full of agony. We touch on the doctrine of his divine person when we say this, for his self-possession was part of the hypostatic union. Moreover, except to him and perhaps to our blessed lady in some measure, yet a measure so far below his as scarcely to resemble it, never was it given to any child to feel the fullness of a child's capacity of pain or of childhood's peculiar pain for its delicacy and sensitiveness, because the child's powers of mind are dormant, and perhaps two-thirds of bodily pain are due to the intervention of the mind. In our Lord's case, the full use of reason and complete maturity of soul were superadded to the weak impressionableness and delicate frame of childhood. This would give him a peculiar fountain of tears, which without meditation we should be slow to understand. This was his first outward penance. Tears were to Bethlehem what blood was to Calvary. They were the blood of his childhood, which yet was not without shedding of blood itself. In all his penances we must bear in mind what we have said of his tears. Both the immensity of his human science and the union of his human nature with a divine person were sources of suffering, which made the least pain an agony, and his agonies were something too gigantic to be compressed in any words borrowed from the nomenclature of human woe. Tears were his first penance, the second was the endurance of cold, what suffering cold can cause, and how peculiar are its agonies, the annals of Arctic adventure sufficiently testify. Yet none of those brave discoverers and hardy seamen who succumbed on the plains of ice or snow, which might be sea or land for all they knew, ever suffered from cold as the babe of Bethlehem suffered, whether from the cold in the cave or during his precipitate flight across the wilderness. Cold, moreover, was but the representative of other natural powers, his own elements made lashes of themselves to scourge the infant body of their creator. If Calvary was the passion which his reasonable creatures inflicted upon him, Bethlehem represents a passion in which his inanimate creatures were the executioners of the baby victim of the world. It is a touching mystery, this subjection of the omnipotent to the feeble stings of his own senseless ministers. His own laws of nature pressed him even to hurting him. He was pinched by the cold and burned by the heat, incommoded by the light and disturbed by the wind, jaded by fatigue and distressed by noise. The seasons rode over him in their course and left the prints of their hooves upon his flesh as they do on ours. To us these are the incommodities of a fallen nature. To him they were mysteries of the incarnation. They were realities at once blessed and dreadful, dreadful from the awful contact between himself and them blessed because they were divine satisfactions, sources of grace, fountains of indulgences, and sufferings of meriting and atoning power. Poverty has been called by some the sister of Christ, by others his bride. This was his third penance, and it was no doubt one of the penances of his predilection. It would seem as if these circumstances of his infancy had been providentially contrived with a view to bringing in as many of the incidents of poverty as were possible without seeming to be unnatural. From Nazareth to Bethlehem, from Bethlehem over the wilderness to Egypt, from Egypt to Nazareth again, and from Nazareth to Jerusalem, for the three days during which he begged his bread, the biography of his childhood spreads itself like an ample net to entangle in its wide folds more and more of the varieties and pressures of his beloved poverty. If he was born of a royal maiden, it was of one who was poor and reduced in circumstances. He would not be born at home, but took the occasion of the Roman census to be, as it were, a child of exile and a waif upon his own earth. 
he would be rejected from the doors of Bethlehem as the least worthy of all the mixed multitude that had crowded thither. He would be born in a cave, a stable, amidst the domestic animals of man's husbandry, he who had come to till the hard earth of souls and make it fertile with his blood, to be himself the ploughman and the bleeding ploughshare also. The poverty of the wilderness, the poverty of the foreign city, the poverty of narrow, straitened toil at Nazareth, all these he essayed, and suffered from them all far more than we can tell. When age grew on Joseph and his infirmities multiplied, the yoke of poverty became yet more galling to the shoulders of his tender foster son. The poverty that pressed on Mary pressed tenfold more heavily on him from the very fact of its having first pressed on her. Poverty is an evangelical perfection. How many have gallantly tried to bear the burden and have had to lay it down again in sadness and a not unsanctified despair. How many who have borne it to the end have been made saints by the simple burden. How many religious orders attest by their ingenious chronicles how hard it is to keep alive the spirit of truthful poverty and how weak even vows are found to be in stemming the current of nature which runs so strongly the other way. Never was there a childhood of hardier poverty than our blessed Lord's. It was his inseparable companion, and if he loved its austerities with so singular a love, it was only because they were so singular a cross. Neglect was another of his infant penances, neglect varied by the scarcely more flattering notice of cruel persecution. He loved men with the tenderest love. From eternity it had been his delight that he was one day to be thus among them. He had come and his sole presence so beautified the earth that it might always have outshone the highest heaven. For was not the beauty of God himself all freshly beautified by the incarnation? Yet in every sense the words can bear there was no room for him. Hearts were full. He was unseasonable. The miseries from which he came to emancipate his brethren were not felt as miseries by them. His efforts to liberate them were more irksome than the bondage under which they suffered. He was born, and some shepherds came to him, but none of the neighbors seemed to have followed the example. Three kings arrived from afar, and the tyrant of Judea strove to include him in a wholesale massacre, while oblivion and obscurity rapidly gathered over the history of that royal progress from the east. There was safety for him only when the unpeopled sands of the desert were stretched around him, and even there the footprints of the dear men for whom he came to die were terrors and portents to his mother's eyes. For the sacred heart of the incarnate God to be a stranger to any child of Eve was an incomparable sorrow to his philanthropy, his man-lovingness, an affection which belonged to himself in a sense in which no creature can share it, and which is only shadowed by his saints in burning zeal for souls. If it were possible, the word philanthropy, like that of the Incarnation, should be studiously kept sacred for him alone, the man-loving Son of God. Yet he was a stranger in the land of Egypt, and his heart was in captivity, as Israel had been before in the valley of the Nile. When his soul yearned for Jerusalem, there were none to welcome him there. On the contrary, he must turn aside, for they who had power there were sure to wish him ill. Poor child, poor boy, men fell off from him who was the uncreated beauty of heaven, as if there were a charm of evil hung around him, even in his childhood, as if a cane-like brand were on his infant brow. Who shall fathom the deep sorrows of the babe's martyr heart? His bloodshedding in the circumcision was another penance of his infancy, which for many reasons may be regarded as a pattern for the unnecessary mortifications of the saints, if indeed any mortification can be strictly deemed unnecessary even for the most innocent of the sons of men. He needed not the right. He required no ceremonial covenant with God, who was God himself. That flesh needed no consecration which was already united to a divine person. It was a strange, separate, unaccountable bloodshedding, standing, as it seems, in a peculiar relation to the other bloodsheddings, as it was not only no part of the redemption of the world, but was utterly detached from the passion. It did not keep the compact with the Father, which was death, and nothing short of death, so that the drops that were shed were not shed to the saving of souls. Was it the homage of the infancy to the passion? 
Was it like the bloody sweat upon Mount Olivet, an outburst of the Sacred Heart's impatience for the plenitude of Calvary? To himself truly it was pain, to his mother's sorrow, to Joseph a heavenly perplexity, to the angels a wonder, to the saints a pattern and a mystery. His weariness was another penance of his infancy. The weariness of the unfatigued Creator is a marvel full of pathos, and to tired souls, and fatigue in these days is the normal state of Christian souls, it is full also of consolation. What weariness did he not endure upon his comfortless bed of prickly straw, and in the restraints of his incommodious swaddling clothes? His very helplessness was itself an unending weariness to him, because of the maturity of his reason. Weariness must have been one of the especial sufferings of his flight into Egypt, and also of his return. In his flight the confinement of his bands and the monotony of his posture must have been insufferably irksome, hour after hour and day after day, even though it was the gentle arm of Mary that bore him. Perhaps also the very maturity of his mind may itself have fatigued his infant body. His sleep, too, a region of wonders, was it a real rest? Did it refresh him as our sleep refreshes us? Did it relax the stiffened limb, quiet the beating heart, lull the busy brain, strengthen the weak eyes, and fill the little vase of life full of new bounding lightsome vigour, as it does with us? His soul lay wide awake the while. His prayer and oblation never ceased. He saw always the olives of Gethsemane. He saw always the pillar and the crown. He saw always the cross against the sky on Calvary. Was his sleep, perchance, only another form of weariness, a shadowy time more haunted by the images of the passion than even his waking hours? All we know is that he allowed himself no joy of any human thing, except what in each case was indispensable to the perfection of his humanity. Fear was another penance of his infancy, and as the suffering of fear is usually proportioned to the giftedness of a man's soul, to our Lord it must have been intolerable agony. His flight into Egypt and his sojourn there were full of terrors, some which we can understand and some which are beyond the reach even of our imagination. It does not seem that we can suppose his science to have exempted him from these impressions when we know how he was ever keeping back from his inferior nature all those succors which could in any way diminish his sufferings. He used his privileges as ingresses to new modes of suffering or to more exquisite degrees of suffering. We should therefore suppose in this matter of fear that, out of the union of a mature reason with feeble infantine susceptibilities, his science would find the means of increasing the pains of fear by enabling him the better to appreciate dangers. We shall find that fear occupied no insignificant place amidst the horrors of his passion, and we should therefore expect to find it in his infancy." but we have purposely enumerated it among the outward penances to show that we are dwelling on those painful impressions of flesh and blood which are the products of fear rather than on the inward trouble of soul which the imperfection of science would have caused. Even if he did not fear, he might suffer from the impressions of fear in that mysterious manner in which so many of the infirmities of our nature were made compatible with the hypostatic union. Perhaps even the distressing panics of childhood were not inconsistent with the maturity of his reason. But in all these questions, what theology most imperatively requires of us is that we should leave intact the perfection of his science. Silence has always ranked among the austerest of monastic penances. It requires long proof and many a mark of divine vocation before we dare trust an heroic soul to the observances of a silent order. Silent men are men that hide themselves in God after a most awful fashion. They even withdraw themselves from the admiring reverence of the church by making the processes of their canonization almost impossible. For many months the infant Jesus only broke his silence by inarticulate sounds of pleasure or of pain, perhaps of the latter only. Yet how he must have longed to speak who was so marvelously eloquent, must he not have yearned to give forth light in whom the whole communicative wisdom of the Godhead was comprised? When he was so full to overflowing of beautiful wisdom and ravishing intelligence, must not silence have burned in his heart like a coal of fire? Must there not have been something in his being the Father's word which would make him exult in speaking of the Father with his human tongue? 
when he gazed with speechless jubilee on Mary, did he not long to gladden her with the music of his voice? Did she not look for his voice now, as during the nine months she had looked for the appearing of his face? When he saw Joseph, pale and tired, was he not full, often fain to cheer the heart and revive the drooping spirits of the aged saint by the magic of an articulate word? Yet he refrained. He had put on the disguise of childhood, and by his perfect observation of it, the disguise became a divine reality. Nay, it was a human reality as well, used as a disguise, yet truly no mere disguise itself. Be sure that silence never pressed on saint in calm Carthusian cell, or in garden-girdled hermitage of Camaldoli, as it pressed on the sacred heart of the infant Jesus. We should reckon also as a separate outward penance what enters into all the other penances as an ingredient, namely the extreme delicacy of his body, divinely purposed, expressly fashioned, for keenness of suffering. It may be considered in itself as a distinct suffering apart from the way in which it heightened all his other sufferings. For we must believe him to have been so exquisitely sensitive that many things were torments to him which would not have been torments to us, and many things which are indeed painful to us would become in him pains of quite a different character. The very winds should have blown gently on him, the very raindrops have fallen on him without their weight, the very ground have smoothed itself beneath his little feet. Yet, so far from this, we are to behold omnipotence coming to the succor of incredible love, and holding this frail frame together amidst the tempest of woes within and barbarities without that were enough to quench a hundred human lives. Such were the outward penances of the sacred infancy. We pass from them to consider its interior penances. As his bodily penances were nine in number, we may also reckon nine of these. The first was his view of the sins of men. As the soul is to the body, so was the sensitiveness and sympathy of our Lord's soul to the delicacy and susceptibility of his body. Even to us, with our common gift of faith, the word sin is a real terror. It expresses a whole world of darkness. It is the negation of all that is bright, hopeful, desirable, or attractive. The possibility of our sinning is a thought to make us tremble. The likelihood of our sinning is our deepest fear, and our actual sin is by far our most real unhappiness. Yet we can scarcely understand the shrinking heavenly-mindedness which caused saints to faint away at the bare mention of the name of sin. Such a fact is an index to us of sublimities of love and of union with God, which are to us little better than terms of mystical theology, respectfully believed in, but out of the range not only of our experience, but of our comprehension also. How far, then, are we from being able to fathom our Lord's horror of sin? The uncreated sanctity of his divine person had communicated to his human soul an unspeakable spotlessness, together with such a tenderness regarding the honor and purity of God as it is impossible for us to picture to ourselves except in the most inadequate manner. If we might venture to think of disease as an emblem of a thing so holy... We might say that the wretched and unclean world was to our Lord's shrinking soul what the meridian beam of the sun would be to a wounded eye. It was something intolerable. It was a spiritual agony, seemingly unendurable for a moment, yet actually endured his whole life long. If surprise could have found place in the hypostatic union, his soul would have been appalled by the revelations which his science made to him of sin. They were unmerciful, overwhelming revelations. He saw the sins of men in the horror and foulness of their kinds, in the classes of their loathsome varieties, in the manifold uncleanness of their separate characteristics. He saw them in the frightful array of their number, their multiplication, their relapses, their prolific families, their long-enduring, self-procreating consequences. He saw them in their weight, in the weight by which they pressed souls so low, in the weight by which they had almost oppressed the mercy of God under the feet of his justice, in the weight by which they were crushing himself every moment. He saw the sin of sins which enabled him in the passion to expiate all sin, the sin of deicide, the murder of God, the martyrdom of the Creator. Thus he had to bear the weight of his passion twice over, 
once as the passion, then also as a sin or series of gigantic sins, he had to expiate his own crucifixion. For all this was not a mere vision of a terrified and tormented spectator. He had to take all these ineffable sins into his own heart and, as it were, violate the inviolate sanctity of his soul by clothing himself in them, making them fit tight to him and burn into the very sanctuary of his life. Gently and sweetly come the surges of the angelic chorus out of the lofty skies to his ear in the cave, but the vision of all that sin is there. The palm whispers and the sands of the wilderness steam as with golden smoke in the slant rays of the setting sun, but the vision has dogged him there. The lotus is slowly opening its fragrant pitcher to the rising sun upon the tremulous bosom of the Nile, but the vision of sin has fastened on him never to be shaken off till death. He is speaking kind words to the women of Nazareth at the well, and the songs of the vine dressers are rising gaily in the morning, but the joy of his soul is muffled in this masterful vision of sin, which holds him down and seems as if it would stifle that inward purity, which is the breath of his very being. His soul beheld God. It gazed into the very burning center of his eternal justice. It came nearer to the fires than ever creature came before, or shall ever come again. The flames of an unspeakable divine indignation leapt out upon it, as if it was their prey, invested it, and seemed to feed upon it as though it were their fuel. It was unconsumed because of the hypostatic union, but the fires would have withered up any created nature if it had not been impregnable and indestructible because of that surpassing union. Nevertheless, it was a created soul, and it must have shrunk inexpressibly from this vision of the justice of God. Here also, as in the case of sin, it was not merely a vision. He was the victim of that justice. It was to prey upon him until it satisfied itself. It was preying upon him at that hour. It could not be evaded. It was his own will, yet was it not on that account less terrible. For such sins, what justice had to be appeased. By such sins, what adorable consuming wrath had been wholly excited. God's illimitable sanctity was to be the breadth of the expiation he had to make. The very vision of it was like a living thing. It laid hold upon his infant heart, bore it away to inaccessible rocks where neither human help nor human sympathy could come nigh it. And there, like a vulture, it fed upon it, taking a pleasure in staining its plumage with the blood, as if it were thereby beautified. What manner of life must his infant heart have lived with such a dreadful guest, with so adorable a terror? His foresight of the passion was another penance of his infancy. Who does not know the pain when a single thought is stronger than the whole mind and brings the entire life into bondage to itself? It is a pain which cannot be endured for long. Yet the possession of the soul by a single sorrow is even a more intolerable lot. Under such circumstances life is not so much lived as it is worn away or gnawed piecemeal with slow, dull, inextinguishable pain. But there is another lot which is even more dreadful than either of these. It is when some dark thought, some phantom, whether of terror or of guilt, seizes upon life and makes it all its own, shuts the soul up in its own gloomy sounding galleries, and haunts it there with a perpetual malicious ghostly haunting. Yet these are all faint figures of the possession of our Lord's soul by the foresight of his passion. When we muse upon it, we lose ourselves. We would fain disbelieve in its reality. We cannot bear to think that such a life was ever lived on this fair earth of God's. The outward tumult of Calvary is positively a relief after the thought of that insufferable silent woe. If we attempt to follow it into the sweet mysteries of his dear childhood, to accompany it as it runs down, as on electric wires, into all the faculties of his soul, and to watch it mingling with his love of God, of Mary and of men, it becomes not only insupportable but absolutely unthinkable. His foresight of men's ingratitude brings us to another of the sufferings of his childhood, intense but more within the compass of our understanding. We are happy now because here we seem as if we could get near to him with our pity. The tenderness of his sacred heart was perfect in the fullest sense of the word. No one had ever been gifted with affections like his. 
there has never been a sensitiveness which could be thought of alongside of his. In their strength, in their depth, in their fidelity, in their delicacy, never had human affections been so divinely impassioned. They borrowed strength, as it were, from his science. The purity of their vehemence was from his surpassing sanctity. His human love was a thing by itself, a marvellous chaste fire, a might of vehement tenderness to which there is no similitude in creation. But it was divine also as well as human. No little measure of that yearning and abounding love which the Creator alone can feel was communicated to the affection of his human heart. Hence no love of mother, wife, or sister was ever, for passionate softness, like to his. But it had set itself especially on one created object, the love of men. He craved their love with all the mysterious appetite of the Creator, adding to it the peculiar romance of a human heart, and that new love, half human and half divine, which belonged only to him as our Redeemer. Yet it was in this very one thing that his love was baffled. He saw how very few would love him, how few even of the few who served him would serve him out of love, how coldly they would love who loved at all, and how many who truly loved would fall from that love through the preference of an unworthy love. It was all as clear to him in the days of his childhood as ever the history of the church, as it unrolls itself in successive centuries, could make it. What blight is there upon human happiness worse than that of unrequited love, especially when it is a love which has beautified its own object by its own excess, and so been its own cause and origin, and when no knowledge of new unworthiness in the object gives a shelter to the wounded affections in the sense of having been deceived? Yet with such a woe was his infant heart continually pining. There have been heroic hearts among men who have felt the sufferings of others more than they felt their own. But the sacred heart of Jesus, in an unexampled perfection, possessed this heroism. The sufferings of those he loved were continually before him. He saw the desolation of his mother's heart, as her dollars grew daily in the light of Simeon's prophecy to their dread amplitude. He saw the slow martyrdom of dear St. Joseph, whose quiet nature seemed so unfit to suffer that the sight of his sufferings was a peculiar distress, as when we look on some unnatural cruelty. He saw the fearful austerities of the Baptist issuing in a bloody martyrdom. He beheld the holy innocence, every one of whose separate pains his infant heart felt more keenly than the sufferers themselves or their wailing mothers. Here again his science furnishes merciless light to his shrinking soul, while his power of light adds intensity to his power of suffering, and to all is superadded the exquisite pain of knowing that of all the sufferings of those he loved, he was himself the cause. His ineffable spouse-like compassion for his church and his keen sympathy with all her subsequent vicissitudes was another fountain of bitterness in his infant heart. The vision of countless Christians who should carry into the endless fires of hell their thousands of frustrated graces and of divine purposes which human malice had been free to fracture was also another vision which was always before him. It lay before him that dreadful homeless home of so many souls as a miserable world of his own disappointed and rejected love. When his childish eyes were smiling with infantine wiles into the eyes of Mary, that vision lay close upon his heart, breathing its fiery breath upon his gentleness. We must add, too, as a distinct penance in itself, the weariful continuity of all these pains, sleeping or waking, clinging to his sensitive heart like the burning garment of Greek mythology, whose potent drugs enabled it to eat into the quick of life with gradual but unsleeping fire. We must remember, too, what the doctrine of his science teaches us, that these fiery visions did not succeed each other with a fearful interchange, which would have a semblance of relief because it was interchange at all. But they were all equally before him at all times, ever present, ever claiming the entire breadth of his attention, ever exhausting the whole depth of his power of suffering, ever illuminated by the whole light of his science, not the least of whose offices it was to be a lifelong instrument of torture. The very forms of life, or states and conditions of his infancy, were forms of penance. 
He had taken upon himself the form of a servant. The swaddling clothes were his fetters. He was born a subject of the Roman emperor, renouncing his own birthright. His life was one of the most utter helplessness, from his infant weakness to his not coming down from the cross. Throughout it all he was the butt of men and the spectacle of angels. He put himself at the mercy of the animals and elements. Yet these were but outward shows of the inward bondage in which he was, to the justice of God, to the sins of men, to his own passionate holiness of love, and to their unspeakable ingratitude. He took upon himself also the form of a sinner, for he was clothed in flesh like other men, and to be like them was content to have a reputed human father. He underwent the rite of circumcision that he might look still more like a sinner, paying to God a debt which was only due because of sin. The purification of his mother was like a public and ceremonial acknowledgement of his shame. He even allowed himself to be redeemed by doves, as if he, forsooth, needed redemption who came to redeem us all. Toil and pain, fatigue, infirmity and death were all consequences of sin, and to all of them he submitted himself as never man was subject to them before. Yet here also these were but outward signs compared with the form of a sinner which he wore deep down in his soul before the eye of God's exacting jealousy and justice. He took upon himself also the form of a sufferer, or indeed it was a reality rather than a form. All forms with him were realities. Suffering was the condition of his life. It was the unseasonable companion of his childhood. There was no moment when he was free from it. He told St. Catherine of Siena that during his infancy he suffered especially every Friday. For there might be degrees of pain in spite of the steadfastness of his science and the immutability of his love. His science and his love were not the only fountains of suffering which he had within him. As he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, so in the eyes of the Father, and in the terrible realities of his own heart, he was the crucified Jesus even from the days of Bethlehem. His sufferings exceeded all the martyrdoms even in each single hour of his infant life. He expressed this truth when he appeared to Domenica del Paradiso, as a babe all wounded. The three virtues of his passion were also the three virtues of his infancy, and the heroic exercise of them furnished the occasions for the fourth class of the penances of his childhood. These virtues were obedience, humility, and patience. He was obedience with the perfection of obedience to the Eternal Father, to the pagan emperor, to Mary, to Joseph, and to Herod. When we remember who he was and what and how great were the privileges of his human soul, we shall understand how wonderful this virtue of obedience was in him, and how heroic its exercise to his science, which perceived from one point of view its most divine incongruity, and to his love when it came to involve others, as it mostly did, and especially his beloved mother, in its difficulties. To subject Mary to the journey to Bethlehem, to her repulse there, and to the vileness of the cave, was a marvellous act of obedience to the Roman government, the absence of which would have seemed to no one an imperfection. To be turned from his course as an autumnal leaf is wafted aside by a breath of wind, by the miserable Herod or Archelaus, was a strange indignity for the incarnate word. But it came within the requirements of the perfection of his obedience. It would be endless to enter upon his humility." It runs through all the twelve principal mysteries of the infancy. They, one and all, breathe the odour of an inconceivable lowliness. The exercise of humility is always more or less penitential to everyone. But there was a violence in it to the glory-circled soul of Jesus, which beheld God and was beatified already, which gave it a peculiar character in our blessed Lord. His patience, too, was almost more wonderful at Bethlehem than it was at Calvary. In both he was forever holding back those succors with which his divine nature was ready to assist his humanity. In both he was refraining that flood of beatitude which was fain to deluge all the faculties of his soul, and to run over through the avenues of his glorified senses. But in Bethlehem he was making the infancy bear the burden of his manhood. His sufferings were as sensible there as on Calvary, and they were more unseasonable, more inopportune, more incommodious, more incongruous at Bethlehem than on Calvary, 
if we may dare so to speak, not forgetting how incongruous always anything but glory was to the incarnate word, whose sufferings derive their sole congruity from the immensity of his dear love. There is something painful to the tenderness of devotion in this view of our Saviour's infant life. We do not dwell on it with any predilection, but it is part of the solemn truth of the Incarnation. It leads us into depths of doctrine which cannot be otherwise than fruitful to our souls, and it discloses to us some of the inward operations of the hypostatic union which will kindle in us more and more the spirit of adoration. What a vision for Mary must have been this interior life of her heavenly babe. She saw the eternal word, the boundless joy of angels, the uncreated splendor of heaven, the brightness of God's perfections, feeling himself the cursed of God, the outcast of creation, with all the odious weight of the world's impurities upon him, clothed, disguised, and cumbered with the many-folded iniquity of its millions of sinners through all its long thousands of years. She beheld all this laid on the shrinking purity of his immaculate soul. She saw the home of creatures away from home itself, and lost, lost in a sea of sin, and sick, sick as at Gethsemane, sick all his three and thirty years, sick in the days of his dear childhood, when, through his love, all other children are careless, bright, and gay. She saw the teardrops form in the eyes of the Eternal, and she trembled as she saw. Oh, how terrible in its sweetness was the motherhood of Mary! Those tears flowed that we might smile, and have a right to smile, and a cause to smile, and might serve God with our smiles, and love Him with our smiles, and almost do penance with our smiles. For in all the happiest deeds of easiest holiness, the babe of Bethlehem has laid up for us now a virtue to satisfy the vastness of God's justice. Henceforth, after those tears of Bethlehem, if we also weep human tears, they are either tears of sweet gracious sorrow for sin, or gladsome tears from excess of love, or tears from the pleasant pitifulness of pathetic compassion, or even with regard to these tears, privileges, though they be rather than penances, the hour will come when the kind hand of Jesus himself in his Father's house shall wipe them away forever. End of section 27 Section 28 of Bethlehem by Frederick William Faber. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Heaven Already, Part 1. There are some who have said that joy is a more shallow thing than sorrow. Surely this is not a just view to take of God's creation, even since the fall. Truly joy is undermost and sorrow is uppermost, but... From this very cause, joy is the deepest of the two. The heart of the spiritual world, where its central fires are, is deepest joy. The world of sorrow rests upon it, as on its secure foundation. As under every stone there is moisture, so under every sorrow there is joy. And when we come to understand life rightly, we see that sorrow is, after all, but the minister of joy. We dig into the bosom of sorrow to find the gold and precious stones of joy. Sorrow is a condition of time, but joy is the condition of eternity. All sorrow lies in exile from God, all joy lies in union with him. In heaven joy will cast out sorrow, whereas there is not a lot on earth from which sorrow has been able altogether to banish joy. Joy clings to us as the creatures of God. It adheres to us wherever we go. Its fragrance is palpable about us. Its sunshine lights upon us and gives us some sort of attractiveness above that which is our own. Joy hangs about everything which God has had to do with. There is only one place where there is no joy, and that dark region is under a special law of its own, and is darkness because it would not be light. There is an inevitable joyousness about all that belongs to God. We are angry with ourselves because we do not sorrow long enough for our dead. We think it almost a wrong to the memory of those we loved. But it is the elasticity of life. Our hearts bound upwards because God is above. We cannot help ourselves. The very purling of our blood in our veins is joyous because life is a gift direct from God. In truth, joy and sorrow are not contradictories. 
Sorrow is the settling of joy, the foil of joy, the shadow which softens joy, the gloom which makes the light so beautiful, the night which causes each morning to have the gladness of a resurrection. They live together because they are sisters. Joy is the eldest born, and when the younger dies, as she will die, joy will keep a memory of her, about her forevermore, a memory which will be very gracious, so gracious as to be part of the bliss of heaven. There are souls too in the world which have the gift of finding joy everywhere and of leaving it behind them when they go. Joy gushes from under their fingers like jets of light. There is something in their very presence, in their mere silent company, from which joy cannot be extricated and laid aside. Their influence is an inevitable gladdening of the heart. It seems as if a shadow of God's own gift had passed upon them. They give light without meaning to shine, and coy hearts, like the bashful insects, come forth and almost lay aside their sad natures and weave dances in the golden beams of these bright natures. Somehow, too, the joy all turns to God. Without speaking of Him, it preaches Him. Its odor is as the odor of His presence. It leaves tranquility behind and not unfrequently sweet tears of prayer. All things grow silently Christian under its reign. It brightens, ripens, softens, transfigures like the sunlight the most improbable things which come within its sphere. A single gifted heart like this is the apostle of its neighborhood. Everyone acknowledges its divine right, which it never thinks of claiming. There is no need to claim it, for none resist its unconquerable gentleness. Joy is like a missioner who speaks of God. Sorrow is a preacher who frightens men out of the deadliness of sin into the arms of their heavenly father, or who weans them by the pathos of his reasoning from the dangerous pleasures of the world. These bright hearts are more like the first than the second. They have a great work to do for God, and they do it often most when they realize it least. It is the breath they breathe and the star they were born under and the law which encircles them. They have a light within them which was not delusive when they were young, and which age will only make more golden without diminishing its heat. To live with them is to dwell in a perpetual sunset of unboisterous mirth and placid gaiety. Who has not known such souls? Who has not owed all that is best in him, after grace, to such as those? Happy is he who had such for the atmosphere of his parental home. Its glory may have sunk beneath the horizon, but he himself will be illuminated by its glow until the hour comes for his own pensive setting. Of a truth, he is the happiest, the greatest and the most godlike of men, as well as the sole poet among men, who has added one true joy to the world's stock of happiness. There are other souls who, for their own good, are in want of joy, whose gift is rather that of an unusual capacity of joy than a giving of it forth. They drink it in as thirsty land drinks in the rain, and it is to be remembered, we are speaking not of pleasure but of joy. It seems necessary to them for the healing of their souls, as necessary as sorrow is for the great multitude of men. Nevertheless, these souls who are, as it were, saved by joy, are many more in number than we should at first sight suppose. Our observations in the world are continually bringing them to light in the most unlikely places, they are perpetually taking shelter under the secret ministrations of the Christian priesthood. Joy seems to be as needful for them as the sunlight is for plants. They grow and expand under it and color themselves with the blossoms of various virtues. Neither is their growth altogether upward, as unkindly judgment, which is always shallow judgment, commonly supposes. They take deep root. The deeper root, the hotter the sun shines. They seek the coolness and the moisture, which are only deep down. They are for the most part humble souls and very steadfast ones, and it is rather the excess of their power than the vacillation of their weakness which makes them need so much of the spirit of gladness. Joy is ballast to them, and not sails. Their nature is made for swift sailing. It is joy that makes them safe sailors. Joy is a perpetual presence of God to them, and a clear well out of which the spirit of prayer is lading the cool waters at all hours. It is joy which gives them their love of mortification. 
It is joy which furnishes the exuberant charity of their judgments of others. Joy softens them, deepens them, elevates them. They can do all things well when they are joyous, and better when they are in exceeding joy. The height of their joy is always the measure of the depth of their humility. They cannot understand how it should be otherwise, when they are warned, lest it should delude them or puff them up. They have their share of sorrows and bear their part in the world of sorrow very gracefully. But they have communications with that deep underworld of joy which lies beneath the world of sorrow, and by these communications the life of their souls is set free. They have an unbroken inward contentment because they are always successful, as successful as they desire. For the spirit of joy enables them to realize a truth which becomes the anchor of their lives, that the endeavor is always grander than the work because it has a greater capacity of holding the divine. They are unworldly because the greater light within them extinguishes the lesser light without them. Yet they are happy in the world with the world's common, simple, blameless happiness. For does not earth look more than ever beautiful when our ears are stopped with the sounds of heaven? The deaf ear gives all its lost power to the eye. He who hears only angels' songs, while he looks on a fair scene of earth, what brighter vision may he covet on this side the grave? He realizes the world too little to perceive its evil, or he does not dwell on it, even if he perceives it, much less does he become entangled in its defilement. It is but a show to him, and he needs but a show to make him happy, for those sounds in his ears are causing beatitude in his heart. The windmills in the green landscape go round as silently and almost as gracefully as the distant woods wave in the wind. But when we come near, they creak and clatter like the grating tongues of wicked men. But the gay pageants of earth's landscapes are always silent windmills to the happy man. He does not go near enough to hear them, and if he did, there are other voices in his ear, and he would hardly hear the outward noise. Joy, too, can try the soul no less than sorrow, and it has mystical implements of its own wherewith to do the work. It has fears also of its own, like its sister sorrow, and it is a gift of the Holy Ghost, which she is not. She is but the dower of a judicious providence. Finally, joy has its own saints to be examples to its own souls, and they are of all saints those, the shining of whose light, the world is least able to comprehend. Beauty is akin to joy, and the beauty of heavenly things has the same effect of making us unworldly. Much of worldliness consists in a mental and moral atmosphere, and the beauty of divine things, bringing with them their own special joy, surrounds us with a supernatural atmosphere which assimilates our inward life to itself after a time. We shall find that this will be the result of our reflections upon the joys of the sacred infancy. If it prophesies of earthly years by its shadows of Calvary, it prophesies also of the eternal years by the heaven which it has already in its heart. As Calvary is the ground melody of Bethlehem, so is heaven the deeper ground melody of both. But where is there room for joy in an infancy so preternaturally peopled with sorrows and perpetually eclipsed with a startling gloom, as we have seen it to be in the last chapter? If there is a realm of joy to be opened out before us equal in extent to that other one of woe, how can it be that the one will not neutralize the other, and that both will not seem to us but fictitious unrealities of the schools? Our faith will teach us that so it was, even though it may not make clear to us the method of this supernatural harmony. We do not doubt our Lord's agony in the garden to have been mental torture of the most exquisite description, yet we as little doubt that at that very time he enjoyed the beatifying vision of the most holy trinity. We cannot understand the operations of two natures in one person. We cannot understand the operations of a human nature with a divine person, so neither can we understand the twofold life of viator and comprehensor, which our faith teaches that the soul of Christ lived on earth. So neither can we allow ourselves to speak as if the two natures were but two voices or two musical instruments, and that the person of the word now sounded upon one and now upon another in alternation or succession. 
As the operations of the divine nature were incessant, so also were the operations of the sacred humanity incessant also. While the perfect science of the human soul rendered his whole inward life simultaneous and unsuccessive, so that he did not merely change from joy to sorrow and from sorrow back to joy. It is true, then, that within the limits of the sacred infancy there is a world of joy as vast, complete, and wonderful as the world of sorrow which we have seen already to be there. They were two lives and yet but one life. They went on together uncommingling, yet at the same time neither independent nor apart. No boundary can be drawn between the two any more than we can trace a boundary between the waters of the river and the waters of the lake, even while, as yet, they are unconfused. The lower phenomena of the impressionable part of his human nature were so far overruled and constrained as that his beatitude should not deaden the anguish of his agony or the foresight of his passion embitter his joy in the love of his immaculate mother. The world of sorrow, then, with all its consequences, was as real and substantial as if it was his only world, as if it were the length and breadth of all his life. The world of joy also, with all its consequences, was no less of a reality and covered his whole life with as remarkable a universality of glory as his sorrow did. Only because of the circumstances of the Incarnation and the prominence of our Lord's redeeming work The world of joy is least known to us because it is undermost. It had no such outward revelation of itself on earth as Calvary was an outward revelation of the inward sorrow. His life in heaven now is the outblossoming of his secret beatitude on earth. Neither does his joy appeal to our sympathies so directly or so touchingly as his sorrow. We are selfish even in our purest love of our blessed Lord. We cannot do without his Calvary. We are drawn to his cross because by his cross he has drawn us to himself. What have we to do with his brightness yet who are trembling applicants for his precious blood? Moreover, his joy was his own, and although we were not altogether without our place in it, as in what that belongs to him has not his love given us a place, nevertheless we have not to do with it as we have to do with his sorrows who have caused them by our sins." By virtue of the hypostatic union, there was an adorable vastness in our Lord's soul which enabled these two worlds of joy and grief to coexist and to be coeval fountains of innumerable tender mysteries. To St. Joseph, the sacred infancy was his cross. Bethlehem was to him instead of Calvary. The earthly troubles and inconveniences which the Incarnation brought along with it fell in great measure upon him as his peculiar burden. It came, too, when he was comparatively old. The end for which he lived, he did not arrive at until he was mature in years. The treasures of God were committed to his soul keeping Doubts and fears, anxiety and haste, public notice and difficult responsibility are trials which press heavily on those whose first manhood is past, and more heavily than common on a tender and affectionate heart like that of Joseph. We cannot avoid picturing him to ourselves as one who was rather fitted for contemplation than for action, both on account of his exceeding tenderness and also of his remarkable quietness of spirit. Yet, out of the bashful timidity of a contemplative, he had to draw the bravery of an apostle. For well nigh thirteen years the Incarnation hardly allowed him one day of peace, and then, when something of an anxious peace came to him at Nazareth, The fires of divine love from the vicinity of Jesus silently fretted his life away. We feel that his whole earthly life was but a preparation for the unworldly office he was at last to assume. Most saints have one eminent cross which towers above their other crosses and gives the character as well to their sanctity as to their lives. Who can doubt but that Bethlehem was Joseph's cross? Yet was it also a land of pleasantness, a very world of joy even to him. He would hardly have exchanged Bethlehem for heaven, just as we know Simeon had prayed for his rest and release to wait until he had seen the Lord's Christ on earth. It was dear to him not only because it was a cross and he a saint, and the saints are ever enamoured of their crosses, but because it was a marvellous and abounding joy. The mysteries which chequered the twelve years were fountains to him of holy gladness and of divine love. 
The sight of Jesus was an endless vision, not only soothing the soul, but filling it to overflowing with spiritual sweetness. The light in his eyes, the tones of his voice, the play of his fingers, his attitudes in his various occupations, were all an overwhelming delight to Joseph's soul. His spiritual discernment and his union with God enabled him to penetrate deeply into all these things. If the unborn Baptist leapt for joy when he heard the sound of Mary's voice, what must the company of the sinless mother have been to Joseph, to whom, next to Jesus, she most belonged? His conjugal love was actually part of his religion. His tender ministries to her were a worship which sanctified him and raised him near to God. Mary is the copious fountain of joy to the whole earth, and it was Joseph who dwelt nearest to the fountain, where it sprang all fresh and abundant from the rock. What a joy must she not have been to him! His office towards the incarnate word was one which he could hardly ever exercise without trembling, but surely it was as the thrones are said to tremble in heaven, with an excess of reverence which is also an excess of bliss. If exaltation humbles the saints, and if humility is of all graces the grace most prolific of interior joy, how great must have been the humility of Joseph, how transcending the rapture of his joy. Love wore him out, and so he died. But we may well believe it was through the concussions of joy within his soul that love came to slay him. At Nazareth his outward cares were fewer, his attention was more exclusively concentrated on Jesus. Jesus also, as he grew up and took his share in the toils of the poor household, in some sense passed more from the jurisdiction of Mary to that of Joseph. Thus Joseph's commanding of Jesus, teaching him, coming in contact with him, were more frequent and more direct. And if, as we believe, each order that he gave him shook his own soul to its center with thrills of trembling rapture, we can understand how the aged saint, in the beautiful furnace of those last burning years, would become the helpless prey of love. Moreover, the shadow of the Eternal Father, as it settled down upon him, could not do otherwise than bring with it a joy too full of profound reverence to be agitation, but one which would have laid too great a weight of bliss upon a soul that was not expressly chosen to bear such an incomparable burden. He was drawn within the ring of those unutterable shadows which the Holy Trinity is pleased to cast around itself, and if Abraham's bosom was sweet rest, full of visionary beatitude, where the old patriarchs awaited the opening of heaven by the risen Jesus, what must the bosom of that awful divine cloud have been in which the soul of Joseph was involved? Even to our hearts, devotion to the Holy Trinity is one of simple exaltation, because it is also one of the purest adoration. What must have been the jubilee of Joseph's spirit? That it was the shadow of the first person which was on him unspeakably intensified his joy. To him was communicated the likeness of the incomparable Father, of whom even apostles said, Show us the Father, and it is enough for us. He was like a sort of visible mission of the unsent father, to whose person mission does not belong. Only his peculiar presence goes along with the mission of the other two. Thus also, by his similitude to the father, did he enjoy a mysterious similitude to the son, and by his office towards Mary, he wore also the likeness of the Holy Ghost, the uncreated jubilee of the Godhead who is sufficient to analyze the heavenly joy which was blended in the waters of fountains such as these, who can name its kind or test its virtues or put into figures its proportions and its quantities. Yet this shadow of the Eternal Father was cast on Joseph by the sacred infancy. Was it not then to him a land of pleasantness, and in its own way also a land of peace, even though it fell to his lot as a heritage of suffering? The same is still more true of Mary. Her double simultaneous life of sorrow and of joy is one of the most striking similitudes between her immaculate heart and the sacred heart of Jesus. She was the queen of joys as well as the mother of dollars. Her sorrows during the sacred infancy were little less than a transcript of his, proportioned to the measure of her soul. The words of Simeon had lodged Calvary in her heart almost in its fullness, 
But, independently of this, the greater number of the mysteries of the sacred infancy were mysteries of sorrow to her. The joy of the nativity was dashed by much that was bitter, not for her own sake, but for the adoring love she bore her son. The presentation was a joyous mystery, and yet it was the first of the seven dollars which the church selects for our especial commemoration. All bright things had their dark side with her. As it was the self-imposed law of his heart, so it was the love-imposed law of hers. The flight into Egypt was a sorrow that would have been wild had wildness comported with the perfections of her queenly soul. Her sojourn there was a sorrow also, and her return was fruitful in hitherto inexperienced vicissitudes of suffering. The turning away from Jerusalem brought with it fresh grief, and the infancy ended with that terrible trial, his dereliction of her for three days. Surely never did land more truly bring forth sorrows a hundredfold than did the sacred infancy to Mary. Yet what were all the joys of all the saints to hers? Her very sorrows were so full of joy that she would not have exchanged them for the most ravishing sweetness that ever fettered a holy soul in a perfect captivity of delights. If we accept the sacred heart of Jesus, was ever any fountain of joy opened in creation to compare with her maternity? The splendor of its purity, the depth of its affections, the heavenliness of its mystery, the loveliness of its exaltation, the magnificence of its prerogatives, the divine beauty of its object, the ineffable raptures of its experience. What has there ever been in God's wide world to compare with the wonderful realities of the Virgin Mother's bliss, realities which we are so far from comprehending that the greater part of them we are unable even to conjecture or suspect? There are differences in degree so great as almost to constitute a difference in kind, in consequence of their rising into other atmospheres. So the multiplication of all the ardent love of all human mothers will not figure for us Mary's maternal love of Jesus, and what is love, even while it is weeping, but the intensest of earthly joys. Indeed, it would be no extravagance to say that all the joys of the angelic world could make no joy that should compare, either for quantity or quality, with the single joy of Mary's motherhood. She had many joys besides that, although, whether we look forward to her assumption or backward to her immaculate conception, the maternity was the fountain of them all. But considering exclusively the direct joy of her maternity, it overtops and outshines the entire joy of the angelical creation. From the day of the nativity, this joy was always at its height in her soul. We have no reason to believe that it ever was suspended. We cannot so think of our blessed lady's soul as to suppose that even her dollars overwhelmed it, or that her pain ever concentrated exclusively upon itself, as on one point the capacious, far-reaching faculties of her highly gifted and Christ-like mind. Doubtless such a thing may be said, but the more we think of her marvellous inward life, the less can we bring ourselves to say such things. At any rate, during the sacred infancy, with the babe upon her lap, touching him, seeing him, hearing him, feeding, clothing, washing, nursing him, with all the varieties of a mother's fondling, gracefully blending with the creature's delighted adoration, and the ever new bliss of a fresh astonishment, the joy of her maternity must have reigned, if ever, over her magnificent soul. Indeed, her joy is one of her wonders, to the contemplation of which the Church calls us by the devotion which she authorizes and suggests. She chooses seven joys in particular out of our mother's life which we are to contemplate. Of these seven, five are confined to the period of the sacred infancy, while the resurrection is, as it were, the joyous finding in the temple renewed a second time, the restoration of that babe of Bethlehem, who, when he was taken down from the cross, assumed again his old childish resting place upon his mother's lap, and the ascension was the exaltation of that flesh and blood to which such honor was no less due in the crib of Bethlehem than it was that bright afternoon on Olivet. The ascension was but the publication of the sweet secret of the infancy. He who studiously and intently meditates on Mary's seven joys will soon perceive that, among all the glories of creation, the joy of that sinless being is among the greatest, catching inner lights from heaven and wonderfully reflecting them in its calm profundities, shifting from diversity to diversity of splendor, 
each change of which makes eye music to him who gazes thereon in reverential love, unfolding for us jealous folds in the character of God, and disclosing him to us in the grandeur of his exceptional ways, and engaged upon his unusual works. At times, too, the mists part in the bright landscape of her joys, and we seem to see, as through cloud windows or glowing fissures in a sunset, into the marvel creation would have been had it never fallen, and indeed actually was when it came fresh and virginal from the Creator's hand. But it is especially in the mysteries of the infancy that these gleams are most vivid and most frequent. In her, therefore, throughout our Lord's childhood, there was a heaven of light as well as an earth of darkness. She too, like him, walked the world in the darkness of her exile. She too, imperfectly like him, had nearly attained her heavenly home, though she had not, like him, perfectly attained it. With her, as with him, it was the very splendor of her heaven of light which made the darkness of her earth so pathetically dark. End of section 28「Section 29 of Bethlehem by Frederick William Faber. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Heaven Already, Part 2 But the grand creation of joy is in the sacred heart of Jesus. Never has the blessedness of God been poured forth outside himself with such overwhelming splendor or with such unstinted munificence as over the created nature which he vouchsafed to assume to himself. At all moments, even during his dereliction upon the cross, and without impeding the vehemence of his affliction, Jesus was almost infinitely blessed. But if there was a time during his sojourn upon earth which was more eminently than another a period of joy, it was during what are called the joyful mysteries of his childhood. The usage of the faithful which is mostly very accurate theology, assigns joy to the infancy as instinctively as it attributes sorrow to the passion and glory to the forty days which followed the resurrection. It is true that the perfection of our Lord's science gave an extraordinary equability to his life by enabling him to live, as it were, different lives simultaneously. But, at least for our devotion, if we may not look for joy during his childhood, where may we look for it at all? Moreover, the object of our present inquiry is not so much, or at least not so directly, the whole joy of Jesus as the special joys of his infancy. But we must consider first of all the joy of the eternal word, the joy of that divine person who had assumed this human nature, and to whom this human heart belonged, which was a cabinet of gladness enough to beatify a thousand heavens. If we might say of one attribute rather than another that it resides in the life of God, we should say that it was in his beatitude. It is in his understanding, because his understanding is the utmost bliss. It is in his uncreated sanctity, for his holiness beatifies him. It is in his self-sufficiency, because his self-sufficiency is the realization of his bliss. He is a simple act, and we cannot otherwise qualify the act or characterize it than as bliss. The eternal life of glorified spirits and souls, which he pours into them, is an outpouring of his bliss. To see him as he is, is simply bliss. Beatitude is joy, divine joy. If it is allowable to use such words, joy is the vital thing in God. He must be God because he is eternally and self-sufficiently blessed. He must be eternally and self-sufficiently blessed precisely because he is God. God is not filled with life as he fills created vases with angelic, human, or other life. He is himself life, absolute life, a living act. But in our necessarily indistinct conceptions of him, joy is to his being what life is to ours, only that his being and his joy are not only inseparable, but identical and therefore cannot stand in any relation to each other, as our being and our joy stand to one another. God is what he is, and we cannot change him by any view of ours. But much depends for ourselves upon the view we take of God. 
Some one view of him is always to each mind the truest view, and those whose ideas of God become simplified and luminous by looking at his majesty from the point of view of his beatitude will find that it will materially influence their choice of opinions in theology and bring forth many fruitful consequences in their practical devotion. To my eyes I confess that the longer I am allowed by his forbearance to look at God, the more one twofold view of him fills my soul with a love which is always maturing itself in fear and an astonishment which never wears off and overawes while it attracts. Outside himself and towards us, his simplicity appears to resolve itself into a love which is intensified by his justice, while inside himself and independent of us, it seems to resolve itself into a beatitude whose placidity is deepened by a creative yearning to communicate his bliss. It is as if his love were dissatisfied with his inward contentment and broke forth and ran beyond him, while his beatitude brooded over the abysses of his own eternity and islanded his unapproachable purity from the contact of created things. Such is the semblance with which the mind disguises God, as if his life were thus mystically a taking in of breath and a breathing it forth like ours. He has much to pardon in our worthiest conceptions of his majesty, and to holy fear all that it requires will be condoned. It is only with feelings of speechless adoration that we can venture to look on the person of the unbegotten father with his infinite fecundity. There is something awful in the joy which he has in himself. His complacency in his illimitable perfections has not the shape and fashion of any created thing, however magnificent or marvellous. He knows himself. He comprehends his own immensity. He fathoms the depths of his beauty. His life is beatitude. It cannot be otherwise than an infinity of glorious bliss. But his joy is not the effect of his exploring his own being by his self-knowledge. All things begin equally in him in whom is no beginning or shadow of beginning at all. His joy is his fecundity, and his fecundity his joy. His knowledge of himself, a knowledge which cannot but unspeakably beatify him, though not as cause, is the production of another co-equal person. His simple beholding of himself is not a process. It is substantial and vital, a living, consubstantial person. He gazes upon himself in gladness, and he beholds the word whom that self-knowledge has produced, and in the perfect similitude of the word he beholds himself. The word is the Father's joy in himself because he is his knowledge of himself, and his knowledge is unbeginning, uncreated joy. The word himself, thus eternally produced, is an infinity of joy in himself also, co-equal in vastness, in magnificence, in eternity, with the joy of the Father. Thus the generation of the word is the illimitable joy of the divine understanding. The meeting, we are speaking human words which are necessarily false, of these two oceans of bliss, the Father and the Son, causes, as it were, a double infinity of joy, which is as unimaginable as it is indescribable. But so fruitful is this joy, so joyous the fruitfulness, that it is absolutely necessitated to produce a third infinity of joy, the person of the Holy Ghost. So universally is this divine person, who is produced by the love of the Father and the Son, as by one principle, so universally is he referred to joy, that the ancient fathers named him the Jubilee of the Father and the Son, an uncreated Jubilee, the never-beginning and the always-beginning self-exaltation of the Godhead. As the sun is light, the spirit is fire. As the sun is wisdom, the spirit is love. While the father is eminently self-sufficiency and power. Thus the necessary inward emanations of the Godhead seem to simplify themselves in joy the further they advance, and their term, who can never be overpassed, is named of the Christian church the everlasting, eternally proceeding jubilee. Thus the procession of the Holy Ghost is the illimitable joy of the divine will. Thus contemplating the joy of the Father and the joy of the Holy Ghost, we may now gaze upon the joy of the Word, which is, as it were, contained between those other two divine persons. We are looking on an ocean, as it were, from above, from a cloud in the air, an impossible station which we may imagine. It is an ocean which has no shores, 
and yet millions of beings lie external to it. It is as unfathomable as it is vast, yet it was all contained in the littleness of the babe of Bethlehem. Nevertheless, through the indistinctness of this mighty ocean, we seem as we gaze to distinguish eight oceans in the bosom of the one, as the one itself is but one of three. There is, first of all, the joy of the son in having such a father. The delight which is his life is a perfect knowledge of the inexhaustible grandeurs of the father. His father's excellence is so infinite that it fills his own infinity. But that such an excellence should stand to him in the relation of father is a joy so unspeakable, a contentment so peculiar, a glory so singular and so unshared, that we cannot compass it with the extremest subtlety of thought. Yet the second joy, that he himself is such a son, is a joy as vast and as unspeakable as the other. The perfection of his likeness to the Father stirs his joy like a tide, and stirs it even to its lowest depths. It is as great a bliss to him, and yet a distinct bliss, to be himself the Son, as it is to him to have the Father for his Father. His simple filiation, apart, if we can think of it apart, from the excellences which it combines, is in itself an abyss of uncreated exaltation. He broods over it with everlasting complacency. It is a filiation always actual, for he is being eternally begotten every moment, and therefore it is a beatitude always fresh and always new, like morning on the sea. The third ocean gleams dazzlingly under the mist which always lies unuplifted over the secret things of God. He and the Father are one, and from them, as from a single fountain, proceeds the co-equal spirit in a silent, motionless procession of uncreated splendor, an adorable, fiery jubilee, completing, binding, limiting the Godhead, and exhausting the mysterious necessities of the divine nature. It is God himself building himself up like a fortress of fire between himself and all possible things besides, the ever-burning eternal watchtower overlooking all creation's limits, a limit to creation as well as a limit to the Godhead, a limit to creation which can itself have no created limit, but to which the third person of the Holy Trinity is the limit in sight of which the farthest ascending creatures come, and yet come not up to it, like the far-seen palisades of mountains that bound some earthly view, the feet of which the misty outstretched plains do not appear to reach or touch. The joy of the Son is his fecundity, his bliss in producing with the Father a spirit so adorably co-equal with himself, and with them both is his third joy, a glory which is a mere assemblage of definitions when we describe our faith, but which, like all definitions, is a glorious transfiguration of sanctity within our hearts. There is a power of holiness in true theology, which they who slight it will one day uselessly regret. There is a fourth joy of the Son in the might and sweetness of that mutual love of the Father and Himself, which, mingling in one fountain, had the power from its commingling to produce the Holy Ghost. The method, if we may so speak, by which the Holy Ghost was produced, is to the Son a joy as infinite as the fact of His production. Under what similitude shall we speak of that mutual love of the Father and the Son, and of its unutterable operation? We might perchance find some figure in the beautiful magnificence of fire, only that its loveliness is too terrible both to eye and ear to let our frightened nature be at peace in the presence of its power. And its power becomes beautiful in proportion as it is beyond control. That love is two fountains, and yet they were never two. They unite, yet they never were disunited. They produce, yet they never were without him whom they produce. He is not a consequence of the love which produces him, but co-equal with it, co-eternal with it, consubstantial with it. There are mysteries which even heaven will not make plain. They will be among the most peculiar of the joys of heaven. Such perhaps will be the method by which the Holy Ghost proceeds from, yet is not generated by, the mutual love of the Father and the Son. The Word is the wisdom of the Godhead, 
The possession of secrets is one of wisdom's joys, a different joy from that of its communicating them. The incommunicable knowledge of the manner of the Holy Ghost's procession is perhaps one of the glad secrets of the word. It is a divine jubilee to him that none can comprehend the outflow of his uncreated jubilee. His fifth joy lies before our imagination as something so surpassingly beautiful that we long to have words to express even what our poor, inadequate thoughts are able to think. It arises from another twofold love, like the twofold love of the Father and Himself, by which the Holy Spirit was produced. It is the love of the Holy Ghost and Himself, His blissful love of the Spirit, and the Spirit's blissful love of Him. In His love of the Holy Spirit there is that peculiar blessedness which forms an element in the joy of the Father's love of Him, as of the person He has produced, and which the Son could not have felt were He not with the Father, the producer of the Holy Ghost. His joy would have wanted this particular eminence if the Holy Spirit had proceeded from the Father alone. In the same manner also, that other element in the Father's joy which arises from the love of the person whom he has produced and is producing enters into the Son's inheritance of joy as he receives the same kind of love from the Holy Ghost who is proceeding from him, which he himself renders to the Father by whom he is being begotten. Here is a joy the very double of that joy which produced a third person in the Holy Trinity. Yet there is no more production. The bliss falls back and scatters itself in showers of uncreated light over the three blessed persons. Who is able even to dream worthily of such things as these? A sixth ocean of joy now succeeds, though its succession is but an appearance and a show to the infirmity of our unsteady sight. It is the joy of the word in the co-equality of the three persons. The Godhead is now complete, as it always was. The procession of the Holy Ghost is the perfection of that ever-living life. It is a joy to the Son that he is co-equal with the Father, and an equal joy to him that the Holy Ghost is co-equal with himself. It is a further joy to him that this sovereign co-equality remains undisturbed by the seeming inferiority of generation and procession. It is a rapture even to the quietude of the divine nature that the limit placed to itself by the mutual love of the Father and the Son should be in the most absolute manner co-equal with the awful unbegotten fountain of Godhead, from whom the Son himself proceeded and proceeds. But there is a seventh joy which transcends even this joy. Co-equality does not adequately express the perfection of the blessedness of God. Though doubtless every distinction in the Holy Trinity is infinitely beatific, nevertheless the majesty of uncreated bliss reposes in its unity rather than in its distinctions. The unity of the Godhead would seem to be its crowning joy. The three persons are not only co-equal persons, but they are one God, and it is only in this unity that their mutual love is majestically consummated. God's delight in his own oneness is inexplicable, but we feel sure it is the mountain top of all that mountainous world of glories, sublimities, and joys, and by the miracle of his nature not to be depicted by art or fancy of man, while it is the top, and because it is the top of all that infinite mountain range, it is the outspread base and the magnific root as well. We might dare to think that, as by some special appropriation the sun is the wisdom of the Godhead, so there was to him, in the same sense that injures not the equal eminence of the other two, some special delight in the unity of the Godhead which his wisdom would so specially appreciate. Who would have believed that another, an eighth ocean, would have opened to our view? The joy of the sun, as it were, comes down from the lone heights of the divine unity and broods with scintillations of quivering, peaceful splendor over the eminence of his own person. He joys in his own unity as son. He exalts that he is the only son of the Father, and that there can be no other, though to satisfy the Father and himself, he will, in special alliance with the Holy Ghost, multiply his own titles of filiation by becoming incarnate, to show how infinitely dear to him that mystery of filiation could be. He too had his unity and his joy of unity. He was the only son he rejoiced also that he was the eternal Son, that the Father 
had been forever a father, and only by him could be a father. He rejoiced that the father never had been without him. For the father's sake he rejoiced as well as for his own. He rejoiced that his own generation had never begun, and equally he rejoiced that it was always going on and would never end. For his father's sake he rejoiced in this also, as well as for his own. He rejoiced that he was the eternal son, because thus he entered into the breathing forth of the Holy Ghost. By his eternal generation it was that he took and forever takes part in the eternal procession of the Spirit. In this also he rejoiced as well for the Spirit's sake as for his own. He rejoiced that the Holy Ghost should have the jubilee of proceeding from a person like his, with a joy which equaled that other joy of being himself one of the persons from whom the Holy Ghost proceeded. In this too he rejoiced, as well for the Spirit's sake as for his own. It was by the eternity of his sonship that all this joy was gained. Furthermore, he rejoiced that he was the necessary son of the Father. He rejoiced that he was no free emanation of God, like the beautiful created worlds, but that the Father could not do without him, nor without him could the Holy Spirit be the jubilee he is. His sonship was the first sweet necessity of the Godhead, which yet could have no first because it could have no beginning. He rejoiced that the majestic freedom of the Godhead, to the full size of which freedom, its mighty gladness swells, should reside in its necessities, and that his sonship should be the necessity of the Father, who could not but beget him, and the necessity of the Holy Ghost, who could not but proceed from him together with the Father, and his own necessity, who could not but be everlastingly and jubilantly begotten. Thus his eighth joy was a triple joy, one joy made of three, a threefold unity of joy which simply concerned his own person as being the only, the eternal, and the necessary Son of God. These were his joys, ages back and from the beginning, but we need not speak of them in the past tense only, they are his life, not his history. These are his joys at this moment, of the dawning of a summer day, they will be his joys forever. How beautiful is thy life, eternal word! Such are the joys of the three divine persons, and in particular the eight beatitudes of the person of the Son. But, as all within God is joy, all his outpourings are joy also. If sorrow is the child of the fall, as was said before, joy was the intended state of the unfallen world. Because God is God, creation must needs swim in joy, as if joy were air and space to it. This was the primary intention. This is the inextinguishable brightness in the idea of creation. Even now how joyous it all is, with gladness almost divinely rebelling against its penal destiny of grief. Earth is like a minstrel beside herself, making songs of her sorrows, and setting even her lamentations to inspiring music. Sin brings the reverse of joy because it is the contradictory of God. It puts out the light of the world, so far as it can put it out, because it obscures or falsifies the intent of creative love. Redemption is to bring back joy and to recover creation's lost birthright for it. For what is the end of creation but to enter into the joy of its Lord? Redemption is thus a second outflow of joy as creation was a first. Grace itself is a sovereign joy, even in what is painful and harsh to nature, as the blithe austerities of the saints assure us, and the raptures of martyrdom authentically testify. But the divine person who has redeemed us is the Word, that person whose own joys we have ventured to contemplate in such detail, that person who has sheathed his infinite grandeur in that littleness of that infantine frame at Bethlehem. Thus our joy stands in a peculiar relation to the joy of the eternal word. All the joys we have are in a very real sense from the eternal word, who has redeemed us by his incarnation, and did thereby even merit grace for the angels who needed not redeeming grace. From the joy, therefore, of the highest seraphim to the blithe play of the Christian child on the village green, all joy is from him. Nay, because of the word's peculiar connection with creation, we may reverentially say that the joys in the bright eyes and inarticulate thanksgivings of animals are from him. He is joy because he is light. This is very noticeable. 
He is the light of creatures because he is the brightness of the Father. And where there is light, there is joy. Light is the peculiar outpouring of the second person, outpoured over every man that comes into the world, the outpouring of the person of the word. It seems to come from his personality and from what constitutes it, which lets in the light and so the joy of the Godhead upon us. His sacred humanity lies in the very focus and fountain of this light, or rather call it light joy, and catching and making visible the splendor, as bright objects catch and diffuse the light, it illuminates all the heaven both of angels and of men. Thus the joy of the word is eternal, illimitable, all-seeing, almighty, all-holy, and quite incredibly communicative. And if communicative in such an excessive degree to all creatures, what must it have been, what must it be, to his sacred humanity? Joy is an inevitableness of God, if we may so express ourselves, in every one of his operations. There is a joy to the rest of his admiring creation, even in the most appalling exhibitions of his justice, and while we are still in the light of earth and the faith of Christ, it seems as if he could not touch us, but joy comes. Even in chastisements it is a deep joy, and the most availing consolation that the infliction is from him. Joy is in some sense our final idea of God, for it is the conception of him which we are to realize ourselves in heaven. End of section 29「Section 30 of Bethlehem by Frederick William Faber. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Heaven already, part three. What we have now to contemplate is the joy of the eternal word as it was and is communicated to his sacred humanity, and especially as it was communicated to it in the infancy. Sprinklings of the fountain rained even on Mary and Joseph. Shadows from those heights fell also on them, and beautified them where they fell. St. Joseph's awe-stricken joy in being the shadow of the Father was a communication to him in its measure of the joy of the Word in being the express similitude of his eternal Father, while Joseph's love of Jesus, having in it none of the natural love of an earthly father, was a shadow of the blissful love of the Father for his eternal Son. Moreover, his office of special minister and steward of the sacred humanity privileged him to participate in his degree in the joyous love which the Holy Ghost bore to that dear humanity. Mary's joy in Jesus was a still deeper and more substantial shadow of the complacency of the Father in him, because of the reality of her maternal office, and loving the Father as the Father of her Son, and her Son more as the Son of the Father than as her own. There was a blessedness in her love, resembling the jubilee of the Holy Ghost in the divine persons, from whom he is eternally proceeding. Meanwhile, if it ever might be said that deep joyous love identified a mother and her child, what identity of love was there not between Mary and the Eternal Son? The authority of Catholic writers has allowed us to call the Holy Family the earthly trinity, and thus, like the soft-footed shadows of the cedars moving in slow silence with the sun over the sequestered lawn, the flake-like shadows of divine things drop as noiselessly as nightfall over the holy family, making the earthly trinity a transcript of the threefold majesty in heaven. We have seen the joys of the eternal word in the bosom of the Father. Let us look at them now on the lap of Mary. The first joy of his sacred humanity was in his adoration of God. The highest happiness of the creature is in his adoration of the Creator, with the closest adoration of which a created spirit is capable. Now the sight of God produces in the soul the highest adoration of which it is capable. Whence, whether we look at a created spirit as passively receiving into itself, through the light of glory, the beatific vision of the Most High, or as it were, rising up, aided by that same light of glory, to meet the magnificence of the vision by its own acts, we shall find that adoration expresses more nearly than any other word the glory and the bliss of its union with God. If the sight of God did not awaken within the spirit the music and the splendor of devotion, it would be but like the sun pouring the gorgeousness of its unfertile radiance on the naked crags of some dreary mountain. But such a supposition is impossible. 
the vision carries with it into the creature a very world of light and joy and love and glory which form an ecstasy of rapturous adoration. Sin so impedes our love on earth and our love of God is so ungenerous and our attainments in holiness so mean that we do little but accumulate words when we speak of the processes of beatitude in heaven. Yet surely our own poor experience on earth must have already taught us that there is no pleasure in life's best experiences equal to that pacific tumult of delight which has many times stirred within our souls when we have been worshipping God. Our very senses seem to partake of the general gladness of our nature. Nothing is wanting. The rough is smoothed, the empty is filled up. A contentment, which is mighty although it is calm, insinuates itself everywhere, and even finds depths in our souls which we ourselves hardly suspected, and takes possession of them with a fullness which appears to double our life for the moment, both in breadth and depth. We are so completely made for God that we are not fully ourselves except when we are united with Him. The joy of that union, and it seems to be precisely the joy of it, makes our nature sensibly one. Nothing but adoration will fill a created spirit to the brim with joy. The lives of the saints illustrate this truth to us in ways which are almost beyond our comprehension. What then must it be in Jesus? If his adoration was, in a sense, equal to God himself, what must his joy have been? How far off were all the ecstasies of the saints from that rapture which bore up on its wings his marvellous soul right into the fires of the divinity? Look at the adoration of the soul of Jesus, that vast ocean of created worship in whose immense tranquility each spirit of angel and each soul of man is but a wave rolling onward to the throne of God and breaking there in soft thunders of perpetual song. How refreshing is the inward picture of it to our love of God and to our pining for his glory. The eye travels over that radiant ocean, exults in its vastness, tranquilizes itself in the certainty of its profound invisible depths, drinks in the unearthly, and yet not wholly unearthly, sounds of its majestic waters, and watches with an unwearied pleasure in which hours pass like moments. Each wave, as it approaches the shining coast, crest itself with light, lift up on high its green transparent wall of water, break with solemn sound in showers of light, and creep with its sheet of broken silver up the sloping shore, as if to kiss the sand and to be sucked in while in the act of kissing it. Of a truth, the adoration of the soul of Jesus was in itself a creation tenfold more magnificent than the whole of this grand universe. It was a depth which only the pleased mind of God could search, and only the divine wisdom could disport itself in the secret life of those enchanted gardens which decked the bottom of that ocean. It lay ever before God in the peace of unutterable gladness, yet the varieties of his acts, such as his acts of consecration, oblation, praise, thanksgiving and congratulation, were so many quickenings of his vast joy. They were almost momentary new creations of it, fresh worlds, endless self-outpouring oceans, successive infinities, because of the worth each act received from the touch of the person of the word. How gently he sleeps on Mary's knee, and yet how beautiful the vigil he is keeping in his unslumbering soul. At this moment he is exulting with joy in all creation. The wisdom which made it all lies open before him. The grandest advance of human science hardly gets beneath the surface of this wisdom. It can scarcely sink deep enough to hide itself under the waters, while it often wrinkles the surface and disturbs the clearness by the vehemence of its efforts. To the poet the artist, and the man of science, creation seen through the mists which always teasingly envelop it to us, is so beautiful that it often fascinates our souls and leads them away from God, as if the medicines which should strengthen us only made us light-headed because we are so weak. What then must creation be when it stands unclouded and confessed in the splendor of the divine wisdom? Yet so it always stood to the rejoicing soul of Jesus, even to us the power which made it all seems marvellously gentle. It sleeps under the green turf, that is, earth's vesture, or whispers in the leafy woods, or tinkles in the streams, or hides under the blue calms of ocean, or comes with its awfulness smoothed into quiet beauty from the distant starry spheres. 
It only speaks a loud word now and then in the threatening earthquake or the sullen storm or in the brief fury of the volcano. But the calm majesty of omnipotence, its gentleness, its tenderness, its love, the exquisite delicacy of its self-restraints combined with its terrific and immeasurable strength, how wonderful must they have seemed to our Lord's human soul. Still more, if we may talk as if he made comparisons, did his infant heart rejoice in the love which circulates in every sinuous pore of the vast universe as though it were the blood within its veins. He travelled in delighted thought, with speechless accompaniment of praise, along all these innumerable winding paths of creative love, sedulous that there should not be one obscure corner in all the countless worlds where his father's love should not be discovered, confessed, and worshipped with created love. But nature was almost a second beatific vision to him when, from the eminences of his science, he looked over all its regions in one comprehensive view and beheld there, mirroring with astonishing fidelity the image of the most holy trinity, all the joys, and surely they have neither been few nor shallow, of poets, artists, and philosophers, were united and surpassed in this joy of the babe of Bethlehem in the radiant significance and divine enigma of creation. He rejoiced, too, with a second joy, and one in which creatures can have some share, to whom the unquestioned sovereignty of God is the dearest of all doctrines and the sweetest of all devotions. He rejoiced in the decrees of his divine person regarding creation. To his human soul, the splendors of the divine attributes nowhere shone more clearly or more attractively than in the divine decrees. One while they were glorious with the beauties of the storm, another while no less glorious in the beauties of the calm. They sang songs around the throne, they were universal harmonies in whose concords all the divine perfections and all created things were blended into melody. They embroidered eternity into the grand patterns of time, and somehow eternity was brightened, not disfigured by the work. In their light the perfections of God contended not with one another, but all throbbed in the one pulse of the divine simplicity. In their light all the difficulties of creation were seen to be but the exquisite workmanship at the point where it was most closely joined to God. In their light he saw the mystery of God's liberty magnified, not restricted, by the fixity of his decrees, while the liberty of the creature was secured by their limitations alone, in a plenitude which could not otherwise have belonged to it. How unutterable must have been the joy of his human soul in the knowledge that all these decrees were but the beams of his own brightness, only seemingly parted by the inaccessible clouds through which they come to us and which separate them into beams, while of a truth the brightness behind is indivisible and one. His decrees made creation so much more dear to him that in them chiefly we seek for the deep-lying reasons of his love of creatures. Hence it was also because of them that the divine babe, exalted so ineffably as the Book of Wisdom teaches us, in sharing now through his created nature in his own creation, as if creation were at once so lovely and by him so tenderly beloved, that it drew him out of himself into its bosom. He could not let us have creation all to ourselves. He too must share it. A created nature shall be the choice inheritance of the uncreated Son of God. The third joy of the infant Jesus was his delight in his sacred humanity. The use of his reason was an endless pleasure to him. Every operation of his mind was accompanied with joy, and that from various causes. It arose from the harmony and perfection of his human nature, from the excellence of his science, from his sanctity, and from the hypostatic union. Even his senses were inlets to him of holiest joy, as they will be with the glorified in heaven, although his sensible glory lay shrouded under the common veils of infancy. To his man-loving heart there was also a peculiar joy in his feeling of kin to all humankind. A brother multiplies himself in the love of his brothers, there is something special in fraternal love to double and treble self and to add to the lives we already live. This is a gift peculiar to fraternal love, which filial, parental, or conjugal love have not, or have it differently. They create other co-equal selves. Fraternal love miraculously multiplies our one same self. 
the infant Jesus was brother to every born and unborn child of man. He saw all his brothers the world over, in all its successive ages. He lived by anticipation in their hearts with minutest knowledge and most detailed sympathies. Their hearts had all their separate places in his sacred heart, and were cherished there as if he had but one brother, and could not sufficiently environ him with love. From eternity his delight had been to be with the children of men, and now his eternal desire was satisfied, and his soul drank always and drank deeply of this perennial fountain of fraternal love. From his love of men, fallen or unfallen, the transition is natural to his redeeming love, and to his love of suffering, which by his own law that redeeming love involved. He rejoiced, therefore, in his sacred humanity, as giving him what his divine nature could not by possibility have given him, and which, but for the miraculous intervention of infinite wisdom, it must even have rendered impossible for his human nature, namely the power of suffering. It opened out for him three regions of suffering, every one of which he traversed in its fullest extent, and, as never man has traversed them before or since, the body is gifted with powers of diversified agony, which it makes us sometimes shudder to think of. The possibilities of fleshly pain which may intervene between ourselves and the shelter of the grave are so overwhelming that the contemplation of them is unwise. Yet there never was a body which was gifted to open out such avenues of pain as his, and as far as we have light to see in the dim depths of the passion, all of them were pursued to the uttermost. With a like completeness he explored the soul in all its capabilities of anguish, and here again his soul was like no other soul because it was so preeminently endowed with the ability to suffer. A man's reputation is his external self, and is a third department of suffering in which we are all most tender, and where the bitterest part of our probation here is destined to be inflicted upon us. Jesus gave his away, as a man flings his garment to an angry beast, and it was torn in shreds, so that his nakedness upon the cross became but the outward symbol of the extremity of his shame. These were three kingdoms with which his human nature gifted him, and he wore them amongst the dearest jewels of his crown. It is true that suffering had become necessary by the necessity of redemption, yet we must look somewhat deeper. His sacred heart was probably not different from what it would have been in a purely glorious incarnation had there been no sin at all. Hence his love of suffering was not a new original instinct, an exotic transplanted into his heart with the passibility of his flesh but only a new form which his exceeding love of creatures necessarily took under the circumstances of a fallen world. The joy of his human nature in his divinity was a fourth fountain of blessedness in his infant heart. It is useless to speak of its joy in its union with the divine person. We can not only conceive no greater joy, but we cannot conceive how so great a one as this was possible to a created nature. No power short of God's could have upheld it from sinking into annihilation under a burden so overwhelming. How was it not shivered to pieces? How was it not burnt up? How did it not escape out of its own existence to elude the intolerable glory of such a fiery yoke? These are the questions we ask ourselves. We cannot describe such things. There is always something of a literary weariness in writing of these things of God. Epithet must be piled on epithet like Pelion upon Ossa, Adverb must qualify adjective or intensify substantive to distinguish between the manner in which what is said of creatures may also be said of God. Reiterated superlatives annoy the taste and tease the attention, and yet how dare we write otherwise than superlatively of the mysteries of God? It is not the style only that is studded with superlatives. The subjects treated of are themselves intrinsically superlative, and whichever way we turn, all are equally superlative leaving upon our minds, when the dew of sensible devotion is exhaled, a weary sense of tyrannical exaggeration. Thus the Areopagite, striving up to his subject with his new coined words, displeases us, and doubtless displeased himself still more, with his super-essential, super-celestial and the rest. And yet he ends by making deep things clear to us, though reader and writer both pay for it by the uniformity of exaggeration, 
The matter spoils the style, but it is a matter for which it is well worthwhile to spoil even less external things than style. But even so, with all the license of exaggeration, we can neither find nor fancy words to picture the joy of our Lord's human nature in his divinity. Nevertheless, the manner of the union is also to be considered as a distinct and separate joy from the union itself, leading deeply down into the divine perfections, and having the eminence of singularity which belongs to so very few of the works of God. That work, utterly hidden from us in its secret method, was joyously explored by his amazed and delighted soul. In this joy there was another joy which also lay apart. He rejoiced particularly in the ravishing beauty of the person of the word, in those mysterious appropriations which distinguished the second person from the first or third. Doubtless also in the obscure caverns of his incomprehensible gladness, there was even a joy in the absence of a human personality from his human nature. There was an incomparable dependence in this, which was full of excess of bliss, like the transported tremblings which have seized the saints when their souls within them suddenly widen into immensities, without landmarks, beacons, or pole star, and they float helplessly out to sea upon the sovereignty of God. We must add to all this his soul's enjoyment of the beatific vision and the marvel of its already enjoying it while he lay an infant upon Mary's knee. The saints lead joyous lives, even amidst their austerities and sufferings. Blind as we are, we can see that there is a vaster joy in one hour of a saint's holiness than in all the outspread mediocrity of lives like ours, prolonged for any number of years. If all emanations of God are joyous, holiness is confessedly the most joyous of them all. Have we ourselves ever experienced a joy in life which was equal to the common joy of being in a state of grace? But the joy of holiness is this joy intensified, and perhaps indeed it is something more than even that. Holiness is a very spacious thing, and God always fills in all hearts all the room which has left him there. But holiness is not only an exceeding joy, but it is gifted with a serene capacity of enjoying its own joy, which is by no means universal in the case of other joys. Nevertheless, by thus thinking of such joy of holiness in the saints as we can ourselves imperfectly understand, are we really approaching to any standard by which we can measure this fifth joy, the joy of the infant Jesus in his surpassing holiness? If the holiness is like no other, so is the joy like no other also. We have seen how lovingly he rejoiced in creation but it is just his lovingness which makes creation perfect. Creation culminates in him. This is the reason all else looks so imperfect. Creation, to be understood, must be looked at in him. His holiness is the filling up of all its empty places, the fruitful crop of its salt seas, the habitableness of its mountain tops, the verdure of its deserts, the sweet, God-praising population of its solitudes. He rejoices in his unspeakable purity, purity is most dear to God. He bears his own spotlessness in his bosom, as if it were the attribute of his predilection, which he cherishes as a mother cherishes her firstborn. He rejoices in the purity of creatures. He finds no other fault where things are pure. Purity of intention is the wood that sweetens all bitter waters. The power of a pure intention is the natural miracle of the spiritual life. The purity of Mary ravished the eternal word himself from heaven. But what is her purity, immaculate mother as she was, compared with the purity of his human nature, and how inexpressibly dear to his divine person must it be, while he rejoices to find united to himself, and so singularly his own, a spotlessness far excelling that which drew him down to earth when he beheld it in his mother? It was a joy to him, and a joy for almost a hundred reasons, that he was the fountain of holiness and merit to so many millions of his creatures, both before his coming and after it. It was a delight to him that, like a forecast shadow, his holiness had had such imperial power before ever it was yet created. He exulted to see the legions of angels like an endless perspective of light, clothed in splendor out of his human holiness. He looked onward, into the ages wearily climbing the mountains of time one after another, and it gladdened him to see how all earth was growing like a garden as the breath of his holiness blew upon it. 
unrisen suns rose in his soul and touched with light the fruits and flowers of far distant sanctity. Their fragrances came up to him from a long way off as the spice winds tremble far over the bosom of the Indian seas. He saw Egyptian Thebaids and many another unlikely spot studded with enclosures of such rare exotic foliage and scent and bravery that no fabulous garden of the Hesperides might come near to their spiritual beauty. They were corners of earth, despised nooks of the world in which the odour of his sanctity hung for a moment and exhaled to heaven in these gorgeous, though transitory, Edens. All Edens, alas, are transitory, but all Edens are the breath of the holiness of Jesus. He looked up to heaven. His human holiness was outstretched above like the canopy of its roof, and outspread below like the glowing pavement of its courts, and diffused through its magnificent abodes as the light that lighted it, and the odour that made it sweet. Thus it is his sanctity that colonizes heaven, while it is also the sole ever-active principle of beautiful life on earth. As God, so Goethe said, for divine thoughts wandered strangely in his pagan mind, is ever in higher natures attracting lower, and so working in creation, Jesus, we may add, is the lever, or rather the magnet, to raise and elevate all creation to its resting place in the Creator, whence it has so sadly fallen. It is by his holiness that he does this work, and with what astonishing activity of joy must not such a work be necessarily accompanied. There are many things we wait to learn in heaven because out of heaven they are so poorly taught. Is not Mary one of these, and her love of Jesus, and his love of her, and a thousand secrets of her immaculate heart, which have not teased us here because it was so sufficiently sweet to love that we did not care to know? Thus we come to the fountain of his love of Mary in the heart of the infant Jesus, his sixth joy, and we sit down there as if idly musing. We know it is an unfathomable fountain, and it is joy enough for us to sit and watch it flow. So men watch mountain springs for hours, throwing up their pulses of crystal water with the lightest tinkling sound like the laughter of children. Uninjured, the charmed margin of particolored moss cushions that little sighing mouth of the huge mountain, and indeed of the old ancient earth, and the gleaming pebbles lie just inside its lips, as if to make it articulate and give it the power of song. They who sit there care not for the rocky veins in which those crystal threads have flowed so slenderly, until many of them were gathered into one to form this spring. They do not puzzle themselves with the subterranean wonders those bright wavelets have seen, or the remote action of the uneasy earth which long epochs since may have settled, that this rocky pore should be their orifice. The flowing of the water is enough for them, a joy to mark a day with such strong light that it shall be visible in memory when years have passed away. So is it with this fountain of filial love in the heart of the babe of Bethlehem, it was a joy of which we see but the outward signs of life as the pulses beat beneath the skin. Who can tell his power of loving? Who can tell her worthiness of being loved? Yet till he has first told these, who shall tell our Lord's joy in loving her? He rejoiced in the perfection of his natural filial love of her. This seems an easy thing to say, yet the thing intended, and so simple sounding, passes our comprehension, for he is God. How shall God, in the exclusive majesty of his paternity, burn with filial feeling towards one whom he has created out of nothing? Everywhere the grand portent of the hypostatic union stands in our path, not so much forbidding ingress to the inner shrines as giving light to illuminate the wondrous way. Everywhere it meets us and makes things astonishing which would else be commonplace. Everywhere it refuses to explain itself, and faith has to render those truths certain and familiar, which else would, even to our reverence, be incredible. He rejoices also in her sweet love of him. The incense of a whole creation is less to him than the grateful purity of her fragrant love. It is the breath of her beautiful being, and he nestles in it as if it were a new life even to him. He grows upon her love as if it were his nourishment, he lays his infant life down in it, that the splendor may play upon it, and lets it rest there, as if he had found a heaven upon earth. 
He clothes his little frame in her love, as if it were in shining angelic garments, and his bath is in the warmth of that clean love which his own precious blood has rendered thus incomparably bright. As he inhales her love, he delights in having created her. It is a joy beyond all price, a marvellous joy, that the son should have created his own mother. He delights in having saved her, saved her from sin by his never letting it come nigh her, redeemed her from captivity by never allowing her to be taken captive. And is it not an even yet more marvellous joy that the son should be the eternal saviour of his youthful mother, and should have saved her with so glorious a salvation before ever he himself was born? In both cases, such a son, such a mother. It is a jubilee to have one so like himself. It is another jubilee for him to take his likeness from another, as he did eternally from his father. It is another jubilee for him to have a creature to whom he can be like, who wore his features before he wore them himself, and who was the dear cause of his wearing them at all. The uncreated son exults in having a created type. Furthermore, there is another joy, which we will daringly conjecture in his love of Mary. As the trinity of persons makes the Godhead never lonely, though it is supremely one, so Mary's love, which was the offspring of her immense holiness, may please him by making his human merits seem less lonely, less exceptional, less utterly detached from the rest of created holiness. Saints, like beautiful scenes, require to be learnt. We must dwell by the side of such scenes in a sort of expectant passiveness and let the changes of the seasons, the lights of the various hours from dawn to deep night, the alternations of storm and calm, and the many-coloured garment of the year disclose to us the capabilities and realities of magnificent landscapes. So with the saints. We do not know them at first sight. We do not appreciate their sanctity. We do not discriminate between the different shades of their holiness. We do not instinctively seize upon that which is their divine characteristic, the singularity of their grace, the unshared peculiarity of their position as ornaments in the Church of God. Yet some saints reveal themselves to us more rapidly than others. They flash upon us, they leap up before us like a sunrise at sea, their brightness tells their whole history at once. Then again there are other saints, the very expression of whose sanctity is mantled with a look of almost impenetrable reserve. The supernatural is so deep down in them that it is hidden. The currents of life have passed so calmly and innocuously over them that they have not laid the character bare or discovered the strata over which they flow. These saints have not been placed in dramatic positions. Their histories are veiled in commonplaces. We should not take them for heroes on the surface. We only know that they are heroes because the Church has raised them on the altars. The great St. Joseph is one of this latter class of saints. We must be a dweller in his land. We must live near his door at Nazareth and watch him. He will grow upon us like a divine thing. He will open out before us and give out his meanings like a gradual patient revelation. The very ages of the church have had thus to learn him as well as his individual devotees. Each age almost has given expression to its surprise at finding him a mountain of much more considerable altitude than had heretofore been supposed. It is this which makes us feel that we are never speaking worthily about him. Yet how often have we needful cause to speak of him in this excursion of ours into the land of Bethlehem? End of section 30. Section 31 of Bethlehem by Frederick William Faber. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Heaven Already, Part 4. His joy in St. Joseph was the seventh joy of the infant Jesus. He rejoiced in the tranquil depths of his interior holiness, and especially in the incomparable hiddenness of his spiritual life. He rejoiced in Joseph's love of him and in his own love of Joseph. He brooded with complacency on the image of the whole trinity which reflected itself with such calm detail upon Joseph's single soul. He was the shadow and created image of the Eternal Father, Astonishingly faithful was the portraiture in its modest, created littleness, but to his inexplicable joy the son beheld also in his foster-father a second self, 
inasmuch as he was the true, uncreated image of the Father, while Joseph was the Father's authentic, created shadow. And thus Joseph was his own shadow also. Moreover, as the spouse of Mary, he beheld in him the similitude of the Holy Ghost. Neither were these such faint analogies as may be found in the work and character of ordinary saints. They were actual official realities, authentic divine appointments with all that depth of chiseling and sharpness of outline and unwasting hardness of material which distinguish the mysteries of the Incarnation from all the other operations of divine grace. Over all this, like the unity of a pensive, tender twilight, was spread a genuine human love of the old man for his own dear sake, and simply because he was so attractive an object of affectionate honour and of gentlest love. It was not only the creature who was in Joseph's place whom he loved with such deep tenderness, but it was Joseph himself, because he was Joseph, because his peculiar, distinctive, personal character was so attractive and so beautiful. His gifts indeed were lovely, but he loved not the gifts only, but the man himself, and with a filial love which might be parcelled out among all the fathers upon earth, and make them all more happy than they could well believe. Joseph's love of him, a love which far surpassed in grandeur and in tenderness the united loves of all the fathers that have ever been, a love so amazing, so vast and so various that we may say of him that in his paternity all paternities on earth share, and yet exhaust it not was to Jesus an unfathomable delight, reaching to unimaginable sublimities. It gave room, even to his immensities of filial love, to develop and expatiate. At the same time, Joseph's heavenly heart, so like Mary's immaculate heart, and yet so distinctly different, so like his own sacred heart, and yet also so distinctly different, was to him a jubilee of itself, because it was, in its own self, a world more than equaling in size and price the common world of men, wherein his insatiable love of men could outpour itself in deluges of impetuous affection, and his unquenchable thirst for human love find inexpressible relief, though it could not quench itself. Joseph's love of Mary was also an incredible joy to our blessed Lord, and Mary's love of Joseph was another joy, for it is the love of Jesus and Mary for Joseph, of Jesus and Joseph for Mary, and of Mary and Joseph for Jesus, which constitutes the unity of the earthly trinity. The angelic hosts worship the infant word as he lies speechless on his mother's lap. Their worship is another joy, the eighth joy of his sacred infancy. For ages they have hymned his glory round the throne above. He knows each spiritual voice in all that countless choir. Their adoration has been the incessant ritual of heaven, while the huge epochs of the ripening earth have been evolving slowly. There is not one of those spirits who has not bathed in his splendors since the first dawn of its existence. What then is there new in their worship now? Why should it affect his heart with such unwanted joy? There is truly a new significancy in their worship. There is an additional spiritual gracefulness in their attitude, a peculiar loveliness, which was not there before. The primal vision of the ancient heavens has been shown them in its reality. The sacred humanity which they had been called to worship in the mind of God is now before them in fact and substance. They see the very child actually present, whose figure in the divine decrees had been the matter of their probation and the occasion of their perseverance. He is before them in the material loveliness of his flesh and blood. He is receiving their worship now as man. They are paying their homage to him as their elder brother. A change has come over the former ceremonial of their worship, or rather a fresh service has been added to it, a new solemnity instituted with the jubilant applause of all those joyous hosts. They are all of them acting over again that action in which they won their crown, the act of swearing their allegiance to his inferior nature, his nature naturally subordinate to theirs. It is a joy to him as God because it is a grand service of praise in honor of the Incarnation. It is a joy to him because of his exceeding jealous love of his humanity. It is a joy to him because it is so great a joy to them. He delights in their worship also as his mother's subjects. It is an object of exaltation with him that he has provided so fair an empire for her sway, and subjects of such attractive holiness, diversity, and multitude. 
He knows how she will love the angels and how the angels will love her, and both these thoughts are fountains of gladness within her soul. He sees her unending government of them, lying before him like some future chronicle of heaven, its pages gleaming with deeds of sacred emprise and the heroic wonders of angelic sanctity. He joys to think also how she and they will joy to see their vacant ranks filled up and all their companies augmented by the conquests of his incarnate love. It is always a peculiar pleasure to him to contemplate his own exaltation of his mother, especially when it is reflected in the rest of creation. But there is a character almost pathetic in this new worship of the angels. There is something human-like in their humility, as if they had with swiftest apprehension caught the genius of a man's spirit from ministering to the humanity of Jesus. How like the lowly self-objection, the unpretending renunciation of a mortal saint, is their disinterested joy, because man's inferior nature is exalted above their own. There seem to be no regrets travelling back to their once bright brethren, to whom no second trial, no opportunity of penance was accorded. They appear almost to love the assumed nature of the word better, because it is not theirs but ours. They put themselves aside as if they were unworthy, and seem to forget that their nature as well as ours might have been assumed, while on the other hand, they seem never to forget that they were saved themselves by the worship of that far-seen humanity which now they behold in Bethlehem. The grandeur of this holiness, the gracious sweetness of this generosity, what joy it all is to the heart of the infant Jesus." But he finds a grandeur even in us, and out of that grandeur extracts a joy, a ninth joy of his sacred infancy. Admirable in all his ways, in nothing is the goodness of God more surprising than in the pains which he appears to take to justify his excess of love towards us. He condescends to look as if he were inventing reasons by the assistance of his wisdom, and the reasons are rather to satisfy us and remove stumbling blocks out of the way of our faith than to satisfy himself. For to him his own goodness is an all-sufficient reason, a goodness which to us would be incredible, unless it condescended to explain itself and justify its excesses. Hence it is from the hypostatic union that the infant Jesus draws his immense joy in his love of us, and that seemingly exaggerated appreciation of us which is the basis of his love. He rejoices in us as his creatures whom his own hand has fashioned. There is not one of us whom he has not called out of nothingness, each of us existed in his mind before we existed in fact. He developed a separate idea of his own in the creation of each separate soul of man. He meant us to be just what we are in blood and race, in genius and character, and in our individual work for him. In all things, sin accepted, and the multifarious unhappiness which comes of sin, we are what he would have us be, and what he distinctly intended us to be. We are a joy to him, therefore, as his children, with that intimate sonship which comes out of the tender relationship of creation. But he rejoices in us as his creatures, with a joy in which something mingles that, in human love, would have looked like gratitude or the sense of obligation, things which cannot be in God. The meaning of this mysterious appearance is that, as his creatures, we entered into the knowledge whereby he is forever the Father's word, we then had our share, may we say such words, in his eternal generation. The Father knew himself, and in himself he knew all creatures, singly and collectively, and it was his whole knowledge which produced the Son. Together with the abysses of his own perfections, every creature was pronounced in the uncreated word which he uttered from the beginning. We all entered into the speechless music of that word, and this is a thought to make us fear and to abash us because it is so overwhelming. Yet of a truth it was a thought that entered into that joy of the infant Jesus which arose from his love of us as his creatures. But he rejoiced in us as his brothers also. Our nature was pleasant to him. From eternity it had been so delectable to him that he would have assumed it in an impossible incarnation even if we had not fallen. Hence he feels his blood to all of us. He rejoices, as we all rejoice ourselves, in the feeling of kindred and in the predilections of its mysterious sympathies. No clansman ever felt so wedded to his clan, so committed to its fortunes, so enthusiastic in its honour, as the infant Jesus felt with regard to the whole race of man. Immense as was his joy in the angels, 
there was a joy in his preference of our nature over theirs, not only because in all things that he did there was inevitable joy, but because of the cords of flesh which drew him to our race. Nay, he even rejoiced in us as sinners, not because we were sinners, God forbid, but as sinners whom he had come to redeem and therefore whom he loved with a new love, a love additional to the many kinds of love wherewith he would have loved unfallen man. For dare we think he would have loved us more if we had not fallen? Does not Scripture seem to speak as if the excess of our misery had also pushed the love of God into excess? Does it not speak as if our failure under our trial had been itself a further trial of our Father's love, under which his love had not been wanting, but had outstripped in swiftness and had outdone in quantity our own amazing guilt? This fresh love was a love more full of pity, assuming in its sweet ministries and easy condescensions the semblance of that blindness which marks maternal love, a quickness to see all that appeals to compassion, and so will augment love, and a slowness to see what might sadden love or dash its promptitude. We must dare to say such things even of the immutable God. It was a love based on the greater efforts which it was to cost himself in his sufferings and his death and the grandeur of these efforts was the measure of the grandeur of his love. It was as if his first love had laid broad foundations and built a glorious temple thereupon. But we forfeited what little claim we might have seemed to have to this resplendent temple of his love. Whereupon he pulled it down and drew the lines further and widened the trenches and laid a vaster foundation and raised a fabric on the ruin of his old work which we had caused, tenfold more magnificent than the original structure ever would have been. Is this what the church means when she bids us sing of Adam's happy fault, as if God's honour found good luck or prosperity, as the psalmist words it, in the misfortune of the fall? But his infant heart finds yet a tenth joy in the foreseen love of men for him. At first sight there is a strangeness in the value which he sets upon our love, and the intense desire which he seems to have for it. But it is a strangeness which is so far from wearing away, that it grows upon us the longer we look at it. It becomes more and more unfamiliar. It rather chills us with fear than sets us at our ease. At last it grows shadowy and indistinct and appears to melt away as if it were no reality. And did not faith come to the rescue of our poor spiritedness, it would shortly seem a thing downright incredible. Now as he lies on Mary's lap, what is it that he sees which so lights up his eye? His look is not turned upward, as it so often is upon his mother's face. It is not Joseph he is looking at, with that infantine curiosity, not wholly unmingled with awe, which we have so often read upon his countenance when his look has been fixed on Joseph. What is it that he sees? The church lies like an open field before him, and he beholds the sufferings of his martyrs, the perfections of his saints, the thickly strewn heroisms of multitudes of his servants, the grandeur of manifold vocations, varieties of goodness, which are rather singularities than varieties, as they never seem to be exactly repetitions of each other, triumphs of the church diversified by the ages of the world, and the shapes of successive evil over which she triumphs each shape of evil deeming itself new and insuperable, and raised above the lot of those other errors which have sunk into oblivion. And with these also he beholds faith's endless victory and its preeminence in all progresses and over all mutable civilizations. All this spectacle is representative to him of an immensity of human love which flows into his heart like a broad stream of joy, and is received there as in a capacious lake, dilating the heart itself and quickening with delight the pulses of the precious blood. We too pass before him one by one, dust-besprinkled pilgrims, and his eye follows us, looks long at us, and will know us again, and smile upon us as old acquaintances when the misty ages shall have travelled up into the present, and brought us before him again in our actual pilgrimage, though he will always have been thinking of each of us through all those misty ages." He sees our conversions, our struggles, our faith, our trembling hopes, our timidly aspiring love, and our foreseen, if so be, perseverance. Already he hears our prayers in the distance, like the striking of the village clock at night in the valley on the mountain's other side. There is a vivid joy to him in it all. Each day as we walk from morning to night across one more breadth of life, 
measured out to us by that overseer of God whose solar light calls us to our work and keeps our time. What a chastening thought, cheering or depressing as we choose to make it, it is to accompany us that we actually entered into and formed a part of and sent a fresh thrill through the joys of the babe of Bethlehem. He found an eleventh joy, even in the foresight of his passion. The littleness of his human heart could hardly hold the grandeur of his joy. It opened itself wide to embrace the mighty sacrifice. It planted the cross in the center of its infant flesh, as if Calvary were henceforth to be the very sunshine of Bethlehem and Nazareth. It bade the passion act itself henceforth like an endless drama before his eyes, whether he watched or slept. He welcomed with joy, yea, with an avidity of joy, each one of the bodily pains, each one of the mental agonies, each one of the outward shames of the passion, as if each was a consoling satisfaction of the fever of his man-loving heart and a grateful safety valve of the almost unmanageable fire that was pent up there. His thoughts luxuriated in the prodigal exuberance of his bloodsheddings until his eye gleamed at the vision of the pavement of Jerusalem all crimsoned with the streams of his precious life, as a mountain top gleams down into the vale when it looks into the yet invisible sunrise and gives its bright witness of a spectacle which from below we cannot see. There is something marvellous, something which looks immoderate, as afterwards, when he went swiftly up to Jerusalem, straightened with impatience for his passion, something unlike his usual adorable tranquillity, though in truth it was but a perfection of it, in the exultation which bounds in his infant heart over the unfathomable humiliations of Calvary. It seems as if it was more than he expected, more than he had dared to hope for, a surprise and accompanied with all the gladness of a surprise which tells us that our fortune is brighter than we had anticipated. To look at his sparkling eye, we should have deemed this humiliation to be another beatific vision. He is radiant, as if it were some novelty he saw, and so had gained for himself all the impossible glory of a novelty to the eternally enthroned God, whose own eternity is his throne, and his own beatitude his crown. His twelfth and last joy, that is to say the last which we can reach in thought, for the want of love makes us unimaginative in heavenly things, is his joy in being the Saviour. This was to be the special gladness which he was to pour over all nations. We were to call his name Jesus because he should save his people from their sins. It was such a joy to his sacred humanity, as his unity is to God himself, the primal, crowning, all-including, self-sufficient joy. There was to be but one saviour. None shared his office with him. There is no God but one. There is no saviour but one. That one is the babe of Bethlehem. It is a glory all his own. No saint shares with him this exclusive privilege. No apostle is his partner in the unity of this stupendous work. St. Joseph kneels down and adores without cooperating. Mary cooperates, yet she has first of all been saved by him herself. Thus his mother falls away into her own modest magnificence and leaves him ensphered in the solitary light of his office as our saviour. It is he alone who does it all. The all he does is the nearest of all created things to a veritable infinity. The way in which he does it is clothed with all the splendor and munificence with which the plenitude of God can invest created office or created nature. It is as if at once he drew away the light and air and space in which the million-worlded universe pursues its way, and in their stead flung from the top of Calvary a rich, immeasurable effulgence which to all worlds and to all creatures should henceforth be instead of light and air and space, a better thing, a fresh receptacle for the huge creation, a new method of universal life. He rejoiced unutterably. He rejoiced in the magnitude of the work, in its difficulty, its beauty, its multiplication, its endurance, its solitariness, its acceptance by the Father. Each of these things have glories in themselves which a whole treatise would fail to exhaust. The motes in the sunbeams were but as a poor little sheep flock easily counted in a mountain paddock compared to the multitudinous graces which should outflow from the fountains of salvation. His heart glowed with divinest satisfaction as he gazed on the abundance, the variety, the unearthliness, the efficacy, the sublimity, and above all the likeness to himself of the graces he should give 
and give out of his own grace the very grace which was in him at that moment in Bethlehem. Here again every word carries with it a volume of theology over which St. Michael's mind could spend an eternity of intellectual contentment. But his jubilee rose higher still. His sacred humanity thrilled in every faculty as the organ pipes thrill with sound, with exultation in the glory of his father, the glory with which he himself, as the saviour of the world, should invest the amplitude of his eternal sire. He looks over the vast infinity of his father's essential glory, which no created thing can touch, nor outward assault come near to violate, and he sees an outer glory lying like a pale rim around the other, wounded like the ragged skirts of a storm cloud when the lightning or the wind have torn them, dim as the moonlight when it is thickened and dishonoured by the steam of the vaporous fins, and so jealous is he of the outermost glory of his father, of that merest skirt, of the most external appurtenance of his honour, that he goes forth with haste to the work of salvation, as a warrior hastens to the battle, that the king of kings may not have to tarry for the victory. He sees the glow of his father's glory when his wandering creation is brought back to his feet. He, the babe of Bethlehem, the sole leader of captivity captive, the sole saviour who has saved for his father his father's world. No Mary, no angel, no saint shares the topmost heights of that exclusive prerogative. Only he has taken the cross into his alliance, and it is he and he alone, he the one saviour and such a saviour. How unutterable the joy! His soul is almost troubled with the delight, almost amazed with the masterful excess of gladness. Forever that thought is with him. Mary even cannot fathom such a joy as that. He hides himself in the full depths of his own heart and sings to himself silent songs because there is no other saviour but himself and that he with such an infinitely sweet salvation has saved his people from their sins. Word of the Father, who shall tell the joy thy Father's glory was to thy human nature? Who shall tell, as it should be told, any one of these the earthliest of thy joys? All this is but a conceivable drop or two of the ocean of his joys, conceived by one of the least of his creatures low down in an obscure nook of his creation. Yet it is into these eternal joys of his that he, by his saving love, will make us enter when he takes us out of his bosom and when, with a smile, like one of those he is smiling now into Mary's face, he will lay us down in everlasting safety, all faultlessly redeemed at the Father's feet. O oh, weary life, faded and outworn before its sands are half run out, who would not that that hour was come and that our soul were lying, a panting, wandering, fresh-come thing, in its nest at the Father's feet, still trembling with the surprise of its first eternal flight? End of section 31section 32 of bethlehem by frederick william faber this librivox recording is in the public domain the feet of the eternal father part 1 we must end almost as we have begun we dared at first to climb up to the bosom of the father and look over into its ineffable abysses breathless with all we have seen and heard or perhaps in our bewilderment have dreamed we come now to lie down at the father's feet hushed and trembling, yet with a contentment beyond what we ever dared to hope. In his bosom or at his feet it is enough for us if the Father's shadow rests upon us. If the babe of Bethlehem will show us the Father, that will suffice us. It would be a life well spent, for so Margaret of Bone was inspired to spend it, in learning the lessons and loves, the sorrows and the joys of the holy childhood. But we must come now to what we may call the final disposition of the infant Jesus, that which represents his whole infancy and indeed his whole self, represents, as it seems, both his natures, and is at once the greatest joy of his divine nature in his human, and the greatest contribution of his human nature to the divine, devotion to the Eternal Father. Hitherto we have been learning devotions to the infant Jesus, now we come to practice devotion with him and to learn his own special devotion from him, and this is in reality the highest devotion to him. We must begin by making sure that we understand what we are speaking of. We are speaking of devotion in our blessed Lord. Now devotion is a virtue of creatures. 
It is the truthful attitude which creatures assume in respect to their creator, an attitude of the soul expressive of the life of the soul, at times gathered up into particular actions and concentrated in special rituals, yet not the less expressive of its whole, normal and habitual life. A devout man is not merely devout when he is at his devotions. He is always actually devout, or is always tending to become so. The word devotion implies the immensity of God's majesty, upon whose altar it lays the sacrifice it has vowed. It expresses also the nothingness of the creature, and the propriety, amounting to a necessity, of its devoting itself to him who called it out of nothing for himself. It signifies that promptitude and agility of self-immolation, which is the perfect state to which it is continually aspiring. It is the natural inward life of the creature before the face of its creator. But by grace it is raised to a supernatural end, and is more than a becoming posture in the presence of the creator. It tends to union with him, to acceptable love of him, to intelligent worship of him, to the possession of the beatific vision of him and to a world of supernatural acts which bring about what mystical theologians have dared to call a deification of the creature. It is the mother of prayer, the administress of humility, the hand and tongue of faith, the heart of charity, the intelligence of self-objection, the vitality of perseverance. In short, it is the essence of our createdness, pure, wholesome, legitimate, and full of fragrance. Now we are predicating the existence of this quality in our blessed Lord, who was God himself, altogether divine in person, but having an assumed and forever now inseparable human nature. We are not only predicting its existence in him, but also its perfection. What then do we mean by it in him? It is the excellence of his created nature, but in him it is utterly dependent on his divine it belongs to him exclusively in virtue of his created nature, yet its acts are not unaffected by his uncreated nature. It is tinged in some ineffable way with the ineradicable unction of his divine person, so that its worth becomes infinite, while itself remains finite. Devotion is not the same thing in him which it is in the saints, or would have been in him, had he been simply and incomparably, even to us, unimaginably holy person but a created person, not a divine person. Like all else about him, and indeed more than anything else about him, his devotion is steeped in the hypostatic union. For while his devotion can only come from his human nature, it must be its characteristic that it is worthy of God, and, in a sense, equal to God's requirements. And it can only be so in virtue of the hypostatic union, because it can only be so through being glorified by the contact of his divine person. We must observe, therefore, that our Lord's devotion is a true and real one, and not a mere figure of speech. For the sacred humanity is not exempted from any of the legitimate conditions of a created nature, except the possession of a created person, and such consequences as follow from personality in the matters of conscience, self-consciousness, and the like. But this absence of a human person in no way impaired the humanness, so to call it, of his human nature. It was not in any sense an imperfect humanity. On the contrary, it was the most perfect of all humanities. It concentrated in itself all those human peculiarities belonging to humanity as it was devised by God, and for which it was so tenderly beloved by him. And it concentrated them in its single self to a degree unknown to any other single human nature, perhaps indeed so preeminently above those of all men collectively, that his single humanity represented in itself the perfections of the whole human race, and something more than was represented in the rest of the collective race, a something belonging to his sovereign humanity alone. It might almost be an axiom, the more human, the more Christ-like. It is important to master this truth. For it is not uncommon for pious believers, whose orthodoxy is unimpeachable in the profession of their faith, to fall into a practical error in their meditations and so in their spiritual life, most of whose elements make their ingress into it through our meditations. These persons realize the hypostatic union so badly, or with such an ill-instructed indistinctness, that they practically conceive of our blessed Lord as of some portent, as if there were something monstrous, we must venture to write the dreadful word, colossal, titanic, disproportionate, in his union of two natures in one person. 
Gradually, in their minds, the miraculous, in the popular sense of that word, as implying some violation or suspension of nature, steals over our Lord's life, and sequesters whole regions of it as lying outside of what is imitable, and not to be regarded as offering even a proportionate pattern to ourselves. Thus the motives of perfection are weakened, and its treasures of example fatally impoverished. Many other evil consequences follow from the distortion of all the landscapes of the Incarnation, which comes from this inaccurate and untruthful view. From all this men would be delivered if they bore in mind that the absence of a human person is no deficiency in a human nature. Our Lord's human soul was not blessedly crippled or gloriously deformed because it had no human person to rest upon. In ways we do not understand, but which the secret laboratories of creation might disclose to us, it was among the possibilities of creatures that an uncreated person might be substituted for a created one, and that such a substitution should not be a violence but a divinely congruous exaltation. Supposing that we did not already know from our catechism that the person of the Holy Trinity, who was incarnate, was the second person, we should gather it from our Lord's human devotion as it transpires in the four Gospels. When we have long and deeply meditated on the Incarnation, there is a new and peculiar interest to us in every word which our Lord utters with respect to God. We feel certain that much more is implied than is actually said, and that the very manner in which things are said is of itself full of disclosures to us of the majesty of God. First of all, when we collect those of his sayings which may be regarded as revelations of God, and view them as one collected body of teaching, much results from the contemplation which we had not before suspected. We then review them all over again from a somewhat different point of view, considering that he who uttered the words was God himself, and therefore spoke from something more than either the abundance or the certitude of his knowledge. In this fresh light we perceive new depths of meaning and glimpses of significancy which disclose to us places where there are depths, though as yet we are unable to look down into them. But the full purport of his teaching about God is not apprehended, even so far as we are able to apprehend it, until we consider it from yet another point of view, remembering that he who speaks is not the first or the third person of the Holy Trinity, but the second. This sheds quite a peculiar light upon his words. Expressions which hardly delayed our attention before are now found to be pregnant with meaning. Sometimes a distinctive light is shed over whole conversations or on connected passages of Scripture, like the prayer to the Father in the Gospel of St. John. Reading and re-reading the Gospels, as those will naturally do who are striving to be men of prayer, it is of no slight importance to us to have different and successive points of view whence we may look at that ground which we are traversing so repeatedly that at last there is a danger of the eye and the memory playing into each other's hands and whole pages of the gospel sliding under our notice rather than engaging our reverent attention. Some have striven to obviate this by reading the New Testament in various languages, with which they are, for the most part, less familiar than their own, and the amount of the difficulty which the foreign language presents, however trifling it may be, is sufficient to arrest the mind and make the old narrative in some sense new and capable of striking us by salient points which in more familiar languages we had not perceived. This truly is a helpful practice, but so also is that other one of reading the Gospels from some one carefully selected point of view, a point of view selected for a reason, and then from another point of view, and then another, and a very moderate acquaintance with theology will enable us to vary them even beyond our needs. No life, however long, will suffice to take us into the deepest depths of the Gospels, but it is not a slight thing to be always going deeper, or even to be only learning more and more, how astonishingly deep they are. We gather then from the exhibitions of our Lord's human devotion in the Gospels, apart from direct texts otherwise establishing the doctrine, that he was the second person of the Holy Trinity. We gather it from the wonderful things said of the Father and the Holy Ghost, and his silence about the Word. He indicates his own place in the Holy Trinity in this covert way, as if it was not so much that he was teaching us as that he was practicing his own devotion. 
who would be silent about the word unless it were the word himself? When he speaks the most strongly of his own divinity, it is his oneness with the Father upon which he dwells, while he speaks of the Father and the Holy Ghost as if in some way external to them. He conceals himself under the shadow of the Father. He asserts his own divinity, as it were with some reluctance, though decisively. But while he asserts it, he hides himself in his identity with the Father, as if the Father were ampler and broader than himself, and his paternity a screen to him. He is continually putting forward his Father's glory as the one object he is seeking, the one passion which possesses him. Even his intense love of souls is to be gathered rather from what he did and suffered than from the direct manifestations of his devotion. If we were left to judge of his office from his devotion, we should consider him rather as the restorer of his Father's glory than as the saviour of mankind, as a victim of reparation rather than a victim of expiation. He is so jealous of the honour of the Holy Ghost that he waxes warm when he speaks of it and uses words of a fearful severity, not only unusual on his lips, but without any other example than the one furnished by this solitary subject. He declares that, while words against himself shall be pardoned, there is a peculiar limit with regard to the Holy Ghost, which it is fatal for us to transgress. Against the second person of the Holy Trinity all things may be forgiven, but against the third there is an unnamed sin, or state of sin, which is especially declared to be beyond the reach of mercy, some stain which the precious blood refuses to wash away on this side the grave, and on which the wholesome fires of purgatory shall not be allowed to act when the grave is passed. We may perhaps be pardoned, if, in order to make our meaning clear, we speak for a moment in a human way, and according to human conceptions. It is as if our Lord could do no more for his love of the Father by being the eternal word, this was an old glory because it was in truth an unbeginning one. Hence it was his grand delight in the incarnation that it furnished him with a new way of loving and glorifying the Father. Of course, this is not true. It is untrue, first of all, because of the adorable self-sufficiency of God, and secondly, because the eternal generation is not a mystery done, but forever doing, like a pulse of the divine life, which, as it never began to beat, can never cease beating. Yet this way of putting the matter represents to us a truth which would otherwise be inexpressible, and enables us to bring, at least imperfectly, into view an impression which results from the study of our Lord's words, read by the light of his divine person, rather than by that of his simple divinity. It serves also to illustrate our Lord's extreme joy in his sacred humanity, in connection with his peculiar devotion to his Father's glory. It was not merely falling from a higher fountain to a lower, nor even adding a lower fountain to a higher, it was the gaining of another fountain for it, lower indeed, not less than infinitely lower, but at the same time new. But are we warranted in saying that devotion to his Father's glory is a characteristic so observable and so strongly marked in our blessed Lord during the three and thirty years? We have said that it amounted to what in the saints would be called a passion, so vehemently did it appear to possess his soul. Let us remember the appearances of it in the Gospels. When we reflect that our Lord was himself God, we must feel some surprise that he should so seldom speak as if he were himself the original fountain of truth and the ultimate authority for what he might vouchsafe to teach. With a few exceptions, he speaks as one sent, as one under authority, as one who is delivering another's message. So far as he himself was concerned, he claims to be believed rather on account of his miracles than for his own sake. He expressly says that he does not bear witness of himself. On the other hand, he is constantly referring to the Father. He is continually magnifying him who sent him. His Father's will is all in all to him, his Father's glory the end. He has not so much come of his own accord as he has been officially sent to seek. Even his own immediate disciples are made to feel that it is the Father who is brought so prominently before them that he almost eclipses the dignity and authority of our Lord himself, which are sedulously put forward rather as borrowed than as his own. 
His words to St. Peter when the Apostle made public confession of his divinity show that he himself had never explicitly taught his own divinity, even to those nearest and dearest to him. It was the Father who had revealed it to Peter. This, then, is the first thing we notice in our Lord's devotion, the constant reference to the Father as if it was his own habit of mind, and as if he wished also to make it the habit of mind of those around him. In the next place, as has already been intimated, he expressly brings forward the will of the Father as his own rule. It is the religious obedience he is under. It is to him both precept and counsel of perfection. His life is in many respects a strange one because of its unearthliness. Its relation to the religious rulers of the nation is outwardly equivocal. It is a life of homeless wandering with unfixed occupations and duties self-imposed. His movements sometimes wear an appearance of waywardness. He calls others from the relative duties of their stations in life as if all established rules were to give way to the expression of his choice. He works his miracles, sometimes with a secrecy which hinders their effect as authentications of his mission, sometimes in such a way as to give scandal, sometimes under such circumstances as to perplex, sometimes with words which sound untruthful, sometimes with a look of caprice, and once does he adorably condescend to work a miracle with a mysterious appearance of human petulance. He offends the prejudices of the Jews by a certain amount of intercourse with those outside the synagogue, yet he will not go so far as to preach his gospel to them. In certain matters he takes his stand as a reformer and disregards the traditional method of observing some of God's commandments. He willfully forfeits his influence with those for whose conversion he is laboring by seeming to transgress the bounds of discretion in his openly expressed attraction to sinners. He speaks against the rulers in terms of the most startling condemnation, yet when pressed to declare his divinity he almost eludes the question. How are all these inconsistencies to be reconciled? Under what system of commandments or code of duty is he living? His disciples have been taught by him to consider that he has an invisible rule in all he does, a heavenly harmony to which he times all his adorable and inexplicable movements. It is his Father's will. That is his religion. He lives in secret intercourse with the Father. It is not so much that he is inspired by him as that he communes with him uninterruptedly. Whether he is hiding himself or showing himself, whether he is among the mountains, in the plain, upon the lake, or among the streets of the city, they feel that it is the golden thread of his father's will which he is following. He does nothing at random, and yet, so it seems, nothing on any preconcerted system of human prudence. Someone leads him. He talks with someone by his side, and it is someone, too, whose companionship does not oppress him. He hints at it, more than hints at it, as his father's will. The doctrine which he puts forward about the father is not less remarkable. He will introduce others to something of the same sort of intimacy with the father which he himself enjoys. This is part of his office. He has come to communicate the incommunicable father. He teaches that the way to the father is through him. His father's house is the many-mansioned home to which he has come to invite us. It is the father who stands behind his parables, and is the king and the husbandman and the giver of the feast. He goes away, and it is to the father he is going. He will prepare a place for those who love him, but it is in his father's house that the place shall be prepared. Faith in himself is urged because it is acceptable to the father. He will pray to his father for those who love him, and the father will also grant to us all we ask if we ask it in the name of his messenger. When it is good for those around him, he asks the Father to glorify him with some of the old glory which he enjoyed with him before. When he comes to the waters of Jordan to begin his ministry, he will have this grave commencement authenticated by the testimony of the Father. When it is his will to reach the uttermost limits of his fearful sufferings, that last excess is to be the dereliction of his Father, and what does not this reveal? He is himself infinite wisdom, and as the word he is in a specially appropriated sense the wisdom of the Godhead. Yet he seems to speak as if it were not out of his own abundance, 
as if it were not the spontaneous outpouring of his own magnificent intelligence, but as if he were simply an inspired prophet, as if he were only and precisely the accredited mouthpiece of the Father. He acts as the word of the Father, which indeed he was, yet rather as if an exalted, created word, than as the consubstantial word eternally outspoken. He calls himself the Son of God, and then purposely wraps the title round with ambiguity and double meaning, as if he were indeed by special ennobling and by singular unction the Son of God, but by no means the everlasting and co-equal Son. As was said before, when he does assert himself, when for the sake of others his love leads him to magnify himself, when he overawes us by the majestic gentleness with which he utters his own praises, the form it all takes is the declaration of his oneness with the Father. These are but specimens of the instances with which the Gospels so abundantly supply us. When we have received them into our souls, they seem to form the best part of our most intimate knowledge of our dearest Lord. All these instances are taken from his own teaching during his three years' ministry. It might be thought that in the infancy there was no scope for the exhibition of a similar devotion, as he was pleased to observe silence, as though, like other children, he had to learn to speak, and as he assumed the disguise of a child's passiveness, and never laid it aside for a moment, we are left to conjecture the dispositions of his sacred heart by the aid of theology, and the teaching of the infancy is altogether by example. In those first years his mysteries were his oracles. Nevertheless, if we look at the childhood attentively, we shall find most interesting traces of the same position with regard to the father which he openly put forward afterwards in his express teaching. The providential arrangements of Bethlehem and Nazareth look as if they were purposely ordered with this view. It is as if his sacred heart had planned everything with reference to this branch of his teaching, as if it expressed more of his heart than any other. Rather, it is not a branch of his teaching, but his whole teaching, the framework in which all the work of our redemption was accomplished. When we begin to reflect upon the Incarnation, we cannot but be struck with our Lord's condescending to have a human mother. It appears as if it was the deepest of his condescensions, and on that account not only the sweetest and most delightful for his creatures to contemplate, but an actual channel of the most substantial and exuberant benefits to themselves. If our Lord was to have a human mother, it must be plain to one who knows the ways of God that she must occupy some such place in the world as that which the church teaches us God has assigned to her. Nay, we should expect her place to be higher, more influential, and in some sense perhaps more independent. And it is our firm belief that hereafter, so it will be found to be, and that we shall learn in heaven that of a truth Mary's grandeurs are such as could not safely be taught on earth because of our infirmities. No province of theology will have to widen itself so much as that which speaks of her. In her measure she will be as new to the saints who have loved her most as the vision of bliss itself will be. Even on earth the last ages of the church are to have a knowledge of her which would amaze and oppress us now. But though an earthly mother formed an essential part of the Incarnation, he is without earthly father. He draws his human nature from his immaculate mother alone. But no created father may come nigh his eternal filiation, the glory of which is his exclusivity, and he cherishes it with the utmost jealousy. This one fact is full of significance in itself. But it becomes still more significant when we observe that, although he cannot have an earthly father, he immediately places close to himself a created shadow of the Eternal Father in the person of St. Joseph. At least the shadow of the divine paternity must be there. The Holy Family cannot be the earthly trinity unless this be so. Bethlehem and Nazareth cannot be heavens on earth unless a fountain of meek government is flowing there to represent the fountain of Godhead and self-sufficiency which flows in heaven. When he looks around for apt insignia in which at once to shroud and to symbolize the grand majesty of his father, he finds it in the extreme humble tenderness and bashful gentleness. Where his teaching is to be by example, he is not content until he has put himself under the shadow of obedience to the image of his father. 
Thus St. Joseph furnished him even with what he could not find in heaven. Taula and St. Mary Magdalene of Parsi are not blamed for saying that the word searched heaven for the stole of suffering and found it not. Yet it was so beautiful in his eyes that he could not brook the disappointment, and therefore took flesh and came down to enjoy on earth a joy which heaven denied him. Devotion will often express itself by doctrinal allegories of a similar description, nor will the large heart of severe theology condemn the practice by which love speaks what is unspeakable and comes to understand what was already in herself, but which she did not understand until it found utterance like this. So let us say now that here was one of St. Joseph's most glorious prerogatives. He gave our Lord what heaven could not give him. There was an impossibility in heaven which Joseph made possible for him on earth, and it was a possibility fraught with a peculiar joy to the sacred heart. St. Joseph enabled him to find in the Trinity below a subordination of which he could not find so much as a shadow in the Trinity above. Not a vestige of subordination could be seen upon his eternal filiation. He was in all things co-equal with the Father. What an intense delight, therefore, was it now to his human soul to be able to express his love of the Father by this peculiar devotion, this subordination to his created shadow and earthly representative. Moreover, in the days of Bethlehem and Egypt, it was not he, the eternal Son, nor was it the Holy Ghost whose relation to Mary Joseph symbolized, but it was particularly the Father who communicated with Joseph, gave him his orders, and warned him as he needed it. We know it is an axiom in theology that whatever God does outside himself is done by the whole Trinity. Yet, nevertheless, certain operations are assigned to the different persons by an attribution or appropriation, the mystery of which is so delicate that it can be no otherwise expressed than by such appropriation. So it most often happens that when God is mentioned without the designation of the divine person, we appropriate to the first person the action in question, as in the case of the dreams, communications, and warnings of St. Joseph. Even the virginity of our Lord's earthly mother is a kind of worship of his earthly father, as if to have had a created father would have dimmed the father's glory in the eternal generation. Thus did Mary's virginity rise up forever in voiceless waves of exquisite incense, or like the fragrance of a spice tree shaken by the wind before the paternity on high, an incense of which... She herself in silent ecstasy was ever conscious, and which the babe watched as it rose at all hours, gently forcing its way to the distant throne, like the spiral smoke wreaths of these sweet gums climbing the altar to the blessed sacrament. And we watched it with his infant eyes, with an ineffably tender jubilee. But even independently of these mysteries, the whole spirit of the sacred infancy is always taking us by the hand and leading us softly up to the Eternal Father. For a child naturally points our thoughts to his parents. A child is not a child when we disentangle him from the idea of his parents. Even orphanhood only brings out the lost relation the more strongly. This is the reason why the mysteries of the infancy give out so much indirect devotion to Mary, so much more than the other divisions of our Lord's life, not excepting the Mary-haunted Calvary. Rightly, therefore, and more deeply considered, they do the same, and in a much higher degree, to the Eternal Father. Indeed, there is a point of view in prayer, from which devotion to Him and devotion to Mary blend with heavenly confusion into one. It passes and is gone. It was but for a moment. Only we saw it and were sure of it, and what it left in the soul we shall never forget. End of section 32。section 33 of Bethlehem by Frederick William Faber。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。the feet of the eternal father part 2 。But we must venture into details, trying the depth of the water as we go. 
we must endeavour to bring before ourselves several manifestations of this devotion to the Eternal Father, proceeding from the greater to the less, until it shall die away into a devotion possible even for our extreme littleness and lowness. We have already considered our Lord's devotion to the Father, as it is implied in the mysteries of the infancy, and as it is taught in the doctrine of the Gospels. But we may also regard it in an historical or rather biographical point of view as distinguishing in a remarkable manner our Lord's own life. Suarez, in this respect differing from St. Thomas, thinks it most probable that our Lord, at the first moment of the Incarnation, made a vow to give himself up to the Father to redeem the world by his death, and that the perfection of this vow involved every one of his actions in detail, so that not only were all his actions, in point of fact, always directed with an actual intention to the glory of the Father, but he had made away his human liberty from the first, as far as a vow implies such a surrender, and that all his actions were therefore so directed by vow. Here is another instance of a fresh point of view from which the Gospels may be read, whatever becomes of the controversy among theologians as to the likelihood or unlikelihood of such a vow. Vowed or unvowed, it is most certain, as the combined thought of his science and his grace assures us, that every one of the minutest actions of his childhood, his sleeping, waking, weeping, smiling, taking the breast, being dressed, undressed, or washed, Distinctly, each time was done with the full use of reason and under the sovereignty of grace for the Father's glory. Thus the sacred infancy was a continuous function celebrated in the temple of that blissful humanity in honor of the Eternal Father. Priest and sacrifice and sacrificial vestments and bells and incense and flowers and angelic ministers all were there, and the august solemnity knew no interruptions the ceremonial ever-changing, the function never-ceasing. It ranged from one beauty to another, from one splendor to another, from one mystery to another, and yet was all harmoniously one. It could shift the scene from Bethlehem to the desert, from Egypt to Nazareth, but there were no pauses in that magnificent worship of the Father. Who can say why, when his human soul loved the Holy Ghost so amazingly, he put forward his Father's glory with such an impressive emphasis? If we looked at the still night in the dark room at Nazareth and the desolate afternoon on Calvary, it is this devotion to the Father which brings them together and clasps them into one. His very beginning, whether it was vow or not, we know from the Apostle was, Behold, I come to do thy will. It was that he might do this will that a body had been prepared for him, and therefore it was as soon as he came into the world that he said, Behold, I come. In the head of the book it is written of me, that I should do thy will, O God. When he goes out of the world it is, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. As the beginning was, so was the ending. He rose out of one sea of the Father's will, like the son of a peninsula, and he sank into another sea, the three and thirty years was the narrow strip of earth which he illuminated in his course. Then what came between the rising and the setting? His perseverance, his perseverance in a life of humiliation, sorrow and suffering, his perseverance in the same solemn worship of his father's glory which had occupied his infancy, only now the music was yet graver, the ceremonies more numerous, the pageant more austere. Moreover, how does he express his perseverance? My meat is to do the will of him who sent me. If we might detach one portion of his life and isolate it, as sufficiently indicating the great work which he came to do, it would obviously be the passion. Our belief that he would still have been incarnate, supposing man had not fallen, no doubt affects even our view of the passion and makes our eyes keen to observe its character of reparation as well as its accomplishment of redemption. We more naturally, or at least with greater facility, look at each mystery as primarily intended to glorify the Father, rather than to redeem sinners, or to speak more strictly, we look at it as redeeming sinners by making reparation to the glory of the Father. The primary end of a glorious incarnation would have been to glorify God by exceeding love of man. After the fall, the glorifying of God assumed a deeper and more uniform character of reparation, deeper and more uniform rather than new, for 
May we not say, when God's all-holy majesty is so spotless that even for an unfallen world something like reparation would have been required? The passion is the miraculous piling up on one sensitive human life of all woes of soul and all torments of flesh, one upon another until they culminate. Surely, then, there is great significance in the fact that his passion culminated in his being abandoned by the Father. Could any further anguish lie beyond the confines of that appalling dereliction, or had it actually exhausted the possibilities of suffering? We may never limit the omnipotence of God, but we may say that such an abandonment did positively exhaust all the possibilities of suffering. Nothing now was left but death. In the grandeur of his unspeakable grace, his soul held on, as if within finite length of arm, to the father who so awfully withdrew, and his last words were, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Each Christmas, as it comes, brings back to us old charms, familiar joys, because they have been joys from our childhood. One of these is the power of Mary over Jesus. Who does not remember the astonishment of his early years, when he had come to appreciate the meaning of our Lord being God, and yet in pictures and in Christmas mysteries saw Mary make free with him, as if he were a common child, was he really as helpless as he seemed, or was he only feigning helplessness? Neither, yet he lay on Mary's lap like any other babe, and after all he was God. Then, for the first time, we felt an awe of Mary, because we seemed to see her more nearly and more truly. New thoughts struck us. We had, so it appeared, discovered something for ourselves, beyond what we had ever been told, and it is always true that what we learn of ourselves goes deeper into us than what others teach us. Thus the mysteries of the infancy opened out before us, and we read them all in the single light of his visible obedience to Mary. From the night when she showed him to the shepherds, to the day when he seemed to adjourn his father's business and went back with her to Nazareth for eighteen years, and again when, at the outset of his ministry, he began it with anticipating his time for working miracles, that he might still obey her, all seemed plain in that single light of his filial obedience. Nothing was left uninterpreted. It was a scene of heavenly wonders, but all was harmonious, and one spirit brooded over it all. Even over the childhood of the everlasting God, Mary's maternal jurisdiction lay outspread like a golden glory. Were other thoughts, were fresh discoveries to break up this vision, as the wind breaks up the visionary landscapes in the still water? Never. Fresh discoveries would be made, unsuspected invisible things, would be seen behind, would be seen through that glory, yet only to make it yet more glorious. Our youth's dream of the Mary-governed infancy was never to pass away, for, as with most of our childish apprehensions of truth, the matter had been most truly apprehended, and in the truest way. Years have gone on, and with the years the heart has gone on also making many discoveries by that light of Mary. Age will not have done discovering, and then heaven will meet us with its last discovery, which will neither dishonor those which have gone before, nor eclipse the light in which they have been made. But what is it which this light of Mary's maternal jurisdiction shows us now? another jurisdiction which lies beneath, another obedience which stands behind, supporting, ennobling, glorifying Mary's power. It is his sovereign obedience to the Eternal Father, and once, by the darkest mystery in the Gospel, for the still further exaltation of his mother, and for other divine reasons, the two obediences are allowed, not truly to come in conflict, but to seem to do so as when, without her leave, and to her intense anguish, he stayed behind in the temple when he was twelve years old. The hand of the Eternal Father seems to put aside the cloud of light, and let in the dazzling brightness of deep heaven upon us, and for the moment Mary's light is darkened, not so much darkened in itself, as darkened to the weakness of our sight, thus suddenly overpowered from on high." We must observe also that double action of the Father and the Son, in consequence of which no man comes to the Father but by the Son, while, on the other hand, no one truly knows the Son except the Father teach him. It is as if it was the Father's will that Jesus 
should not bear witness of himself, in order that he, the Father, might reserve to himself the joy of bearing witness to the Son, as he did over the river Jordan, and again when the heavenly voice spoke of glorifying him. He would magnify the Son, as the Son was ever delighting to magnify him. There should be something reciprocal, even in the manner of the love which the Father bore to the sacred humanity. The grand instance of this, to which we shall have to refer again, was his secretly revealing to Peter the doctrine of our blessed Lord's divinity. Flesh and blood, said Jesus, have not revealed it to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. This secret revelation of the Eternal Father to St. Peter is one of the most striking incidents recorded in the Gospels, and fascinates our attention as well by its singularity as by the depths of contemplation which it opens out to us. If it be not irreverent, so to speak, we might compare it with those facts in biographies which are sometimes recorded as single incidents, to which no prominence is given and on which no stress is laid, yet which nevertheless flash upon us as each of them the keystone of a whole biography. There is one more event in our Lord's life which must be dwelt upon, yet we dwell on it with reluctance, as it is impossible to do justice either to its tenderness or to its mystery. Every one has something of religion in his heart which is hard for him to put into words just because it has grown so familiar in his thoughts that it never assumes there the vesture of words and we almost fear to desecrate it by clothing it in speech. Such to us is the event in question of which we are going to speak. Such has it been to us so far back as our memory can go. It dawns upon us in the Gospels that our Lord must have made the person of the Father, the subject of frequent conversation with his apostles. We are inclined to think he must have spoken most intimately and perhaps minutely with them on this attractive subject. He may probably have communicated to them more wonders regarding the paternity of God than even our rich theology has taught us. Such a subject would be a natural one for him to dwell upon because it was that which was most abundant in his heart, and he himself has said that out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Moreover, he so openly put forward his devotion to the Father that it would be likely for him in his secret teaching to fill in the outline which he had given more openly. There seems no improbability in this consideration when it is suggested to us. But what is there which actually intimates it to us? Surely, if much had not gone before, which is not recorded in the Gospels, St. Philip never could have said, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Most beautiful words, the pathetic utterance of all creation, allowed to articulate itself in the voice of that dear apostle. On the first reading, how beautiful were the words, and now when read, when pondered, when whispered to ourselves, when breathed to the same Lord now in prayer, how thousandfold more beautiful. Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Yes, enough, that gentle, unconstrained, most truthful word, enough. Precisely what creation pines for, precisely what will bring that contentment which flows from the filling of our natures and the satisfaction of our holiest desires. Enough, saints and angels, Joseph and Mary, they alone could tell us of that enough. We must tear ourselves away from those little words, each of which has so great a soul, so large a heart within it. We must turn to observe our Saviour's answer to Philip, an answer with what a look of love assuredly accompanied. He is not so much surprised that the Apostle should have received thus deeply into his soul what he had taught him about the Father, as surprised that his knowledge had not led him further. Here again we have indications of a world of secret teaching. So long a time have I been with you, and have you not known me? Philip, he that seeth me seeth the Father also. How sayest thou, show us the Father? Believe you not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? Otherwise believe for the very work's sake. Amen, amen, I say to you, He that believeth in me, the works that I do, he also shall do, and greater than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. And whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. His oneness with the Father is dearer to him than his distinctness. Wonderful, for he was the express image of the Father, the brightness of his glory, and the figure of his substance.
Thus they who were nearest to our blessed Lord and whose souls were nurtured on his secret teaching may be described as men who pined to see the Father, who were discontented with all things else, who did not rest even in the presence of the Son, but whose wants were measured exactly by the vision of the Father. It would be enough. But there would be no enough short of that, no enough elsewhere, no enough till then. Ages have passed since, and Jesus is leading his royal life in heaven, But is he changed in this respect? Ages, perhaps, it is sad to think, yet surely not an unwise humility so to think, for there is not a grain of despondency in the thought. Ages, perhaps, may pass amidst the cleansing fires before the divine mercy shall bid St. Michael lift us out of the burning sea and place us on the coasts of heaven. Will Jesus have changed by that time in this respect? No. Strangely, in unison with the spirit of the three and thirty years will his greeting be, and expressive of the same, not unforgotten only, but unbroken thought. Come, blessed of my Father. Blessed of my Father, that is our eternal name, the name given us in our first baptism of heavenly beatitude. Blessed of my Father. How those words come to us in the tingling stillness of the night, when panic fears oppress our loneliness and so strangely vex our souls. How they rise soft and clear above the rolling of the world in hours of weariness and of obstinate temptations which grace seems at times to multiply rather than repel. How they sing songs to the fear of death and lull it when it wakes and cries. Blessed of my father. Why blessed of my father? Do the words lead on to that date at which he shall deliver up the kingdom to God and the Father, and the Son himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all? For, says the Apostle, when all things are put under Jesus, he is undoubtedly accepted who put all things under him. And who is he but the Eternal Father? But we are reaching into the darkness of unapproachable mysteries. Enough for us... It was Philip's chosen word, enough if only we are blessed of the Father. We are now, in tracing still further this special devotion to the Father, brought again to that frequently recurring difficulty of speaking of our blessed Lady without doing despite to our own conceptions of her. We must consider her devotion to the Eternal Father and how in her also it was special. But when we have seen what it was in the soul of Jesus, we can understand what it was in hers. According to the proportions of her inferiority, it was still the same besetting thought, the same holy possession of soul, the same solitary and sacred enthusiasm which it was in his. But there were circumstances in her position and influence which gave a peculiar character to this devotion in her, and these we must examine. She was the sole earthly parent of Jesus. In herself she enjoyed the rights both of father and of mother. This was one of the miraculous glories of her maternity, a subject to her of frequent meditation and of incessant joy. It was not only that her own honor was, as it were, doubled thereby, but the glory of God was concerned in it. It was for the honor of Jesus. It was for the honor of the Eternal Father. The Incarnation would have been quite a different mystery if it had been otherwise, and therefore we may believe that some of its especially divine splendor was involved in this very fact of Mary's being the sole earthly parent. She felt, therefore, that this peculiarity in her position reflected peculiar honor upon the Eternal Father, and therefore was a ground of devotion to Him which, while all could feel it, belonged eminently to herself." Moreover, the same fact would cause her thoughts to be continually resting on her son's heavenly father. The mother's love of her child is always entwined with thoughts of its father and with continual reference to him. A widowed mother has a double love of her child because she loves him for her husband's sake as well as for her own. Conjugal affection is an element which can never be absent from the perfection of maternal love. Now in Mary's case there were heavenly peculiarities in every one of these circumstances, Her love of Jesus was necessarily entwined with thoughts of his father, but he was God and the first person of the Holy Trinity. She had nothing to do with the eternal generation of the Son, except to be a portion of the shadow of it. She also was, in a certain sense, widowed, and St. Joseph did but veil her widowhood. Yet she had not to love two in one. She had not to love the lost father in the child, 
as well as the child himself. She had to love her child doubly, to love him as being both his father and his mother, and to love him thus doubly for his own sake alone. What conjugal affection does in the maternal love of others, adoration had to do in hers, a double adoration both of the invisible father and of the visible son. Furthermore, her maternity was part of her religion. It occupied a great space in her faith. It was linked with some of the most inscrutable mysteries of the Godhead. It never could be out of her thoughts for a moment, even without any reference to her own delight in it, because it was the created echo of the uncreated generation of the Word. The result of all these things was not only that the interior of her mind belonged so singularly to herself that it could not be shared, nor even fully apprehended by any other creature, but that the unity into which it resolved itself was, as consideration shows us, devotion to the Eternal Father. All the circumstances rose upward to his throne. They were like flights of steps from the north and the south, from the east and the west, but all ascending to that single throne. It takes long to master these things in all their bearings, even so far as we are able to master them. But can time be better spent than in elucidating the grandeurs of Mary? We remember that text of scripture which the church applies to her. They who elucidate me shall have eternal life. We must consider also that one of the prerogatives of Mary's singular holiness was that she could enter more than any other mere creature into the inward dispositions of God. The mind of God was more open to her. The affections of God were more intimately communicated to her. She saw the Father's exceeding love of Jesus more clearly than any wandering angel sees it now. She saw down into its pellucid depths and worshipped in the thankfulness of profoundest fear. The vision of this love of the Father for Jesus doubtless excited in her heart a new love of Jesus. It was a new pattern for her to copy. It was another proof to her that even she did not love Jesus as he deserved. It was a fresh incentive to her to dilate her heart more and more. It was a substantial and efficacious fire which actually affected the dilation of her heart for her. It was the Father's love but he did not keep it to himself. He communicated to her so much of it as she could bear, and benignantly made it hers as well as his. But while it was in her a new light by which to see and appreciate Jesus, and at the same time a new power to love him, it also, because of her own immense love of Jesus, produced in her heart a new love of the Father. She loved him the more because he so loved the Son. She loved him for so far overshooting her own maternal love. She loved him because he loved Jesus to the full and left nothing wanting in the perfection of his love. She loved him because his love at once took her office out of her own hands and at the same time enabled her to fulfill it as she could not otherwise have done. She loved him because his love was a revelation of Jesus and a revelation made in so touchingly maternal a manner. It was the confidence of the Heavenly Father to the earthly mother, confiding to her in secret the real worth and character and dearness of him who was the child of both in two such mysterious ways. Thus she ventured on this account to love the Father with a sort of timid exultation, as if she had a kind of right to share in the Father's peculiar paternal love of Jesus. It is impossible for us to realize the depths of the profoundest adoration into which Mary's soul must have been cast by this awful communication with the Father, in that which is his own eternal singularity, in that which actually makes him to be the Father and is the fountain of his paternity, in that which would have seemed to all creatures to be in any measure or degree absolutely incommunicable. See how, for the moment, Mary and the Eternal Father blend uncomminglingly in one. In many lights the Mother of God is worshipful in her dread majesty. In none does she so completely strike us dumb before her majesty as in this. Her own similitude to Jesus would naturally involve her, having caught from him this the master devotion of his sacred heart to which she knew and rejoiced it should be so that even his love of her was utterly subordinate. But these other peculiar circumstances of her own give her devotion to the Eternal Father a character and distinctness which make it something more than a copy of our Lord's, reduced to the lesser dimensions of her heart. 
but her communication with the father in his paternity, out of which flows a special love both of him and of the son, is not her only fountain of devotion to him, nor the only mystery which seems to draw her from her visible vicinity to God into the blinding splendors of the very throne. As she shares in the father's paternity, so also she shares in the son's filiation. She was herself in a special way, through predestination and because of the infant Jesus, the eternal daughter of the father. Here too was a fresh source of the love of Jesus, a beautiful, strange love from the mingling of the mother and the sister in one heart. It was a different tie to him from the direct tie of the incarnation, though even this new tie came from the selfsame mystery. Here also was a look, a shadow, a fair umbrage, it could not be more, yet how much was even this, of dear equality with Jesus, dearer far than the apparent superiority over him, which her maternal jurisdiction conferred upon her. Here also was another fountain of love of the Eternal Father, another marvellous foundation on which the temple of her devotion to him might be raised. Her grandeurs dazzle us, but it is not so much the glory of them which we are to look at now as the wonderful, intricate simplicity with which they all converge upon her devotion to the Eternal Father. End of section 33《Section 34 of Bethlehem by Frederick William Faber》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Feet of the Eternal Father, Part 3 Now let us advance a step further in the history of this devotion. When we first entered upon our inquiry into the mysteries of Bethlehem, we compared the sacred infancy to a forest and St. Joseph to its odorous undergrowth, whose fragrance would be to us, whichever way we bent our steps, like the atmosphere of the place. So has it been throughout, and now, when we come to speak of his devotion to the Eternal Father, we shall have to repeat many things which have been said before, or which at least have been treated from a different point of view. But repetition about him is hardly wearisome. It is plain at first sight that devotion to the Eternal Father must have been the length and breadth of his whole sanctity. It was the characteristic from which his holiness derived its genius and its unity. His dread office of being the shadow of the Father could not import less than this. His loving care of Mary came out of it and was included within it. He was the shadow of the Father to her as well as to Jesus. His tender ministries of our blessed Lord and the exercise of authority with which he worshipped him, a worship solitary among all the worships that surround the word, all came out of his office. Indeed, it was to Jesus primarily that Joseph was the shadow of the Father. It might even be said that to himself also he was the shadow of the Father, for in that shadow his soul grew and his predestination was accomplished. It was a deep, soft, beautifying, soothing shade over his life perpetually. It was his light. He saw and worked by the light of that shadow. Moreover, it was his form of love of Jesus for as he had to imitate the office of the eternal father so likewise did he imitate his love there was something more truly paternal in his tenderness to our lord than the tenderness of common earthly fathers because though he was not a true father his office came out of a deeper paternity divine shadows are substantial they are shadows in relation to the eternal height which casts them but they lie defined substantial and transfiguring on created things we must remind ourselves of this, although we have indicated the same truth before. This communication of the divine paternity was Joseph's highest right to love Jesus. He might love him as his creature. He might love him as one of his redeemed. He might love him with a personal love, as having been laden with gifts and graces by him. He might love him as Mary's child, with a love into which he might throw all the intensity of his love of Mary. He might love him for his own sake because he was so winning and attractive and encompassed with divine fascinations. He might love him as we come to love all whom we have saved from death or danger or who have permitted us to show them kindness, and this love would be in proportion to the dignity of his own office and the excellence of his foster child. But his highest love of him was from his highest right to love him, and that resided in his being the shadow of the Father. He loved Jesus in and by his love of the Eternal Father, and by the likeness to the Father which the Eternal Father had communicated to him, 
whereby he was raised to the further and inexpressible dignity of likeness to the Son himself, who was also the image of the Father. Thus is it that the loves of the earthly trinity are illuminated by quivering beams, by shooting splendors, by pulses of throbbing light, which seem to belong rather to the inward life of the heavenly trinity, adorably communicated to that sweetest growth of all creation, the Holy Family. Joseph's devotion to the Eternal Father was also his form of love of Mary. He was especially her husband as the foster father of Jesus. His conjugal office was simply a part of his shadow of the Father. His office to her rose out of the same source as his office to Jesus, namely out of the same shadow. As with Jesus, so with Mary, he might love her for many reasons and with various pure and holy loves. As his spouse, as the mother of Jesus, as the spouse of the Holy Ghost, as the daughter of the Father, for her love of Jesus, for her love of himself, for her own transcending excellence. For all these things he might love her, and did love her, as only so holy a heart could love. But his love of her, inasmuch as he was the shadow of the Father, was a wider love than any or all of these, and rested upon a yet more divine appointment. Indeed, it did in matter-of-fact presuppose and include all those other loves. Thus his devotion to the Father sank into all the details of his life by the necessity of the case. It was his vocation, the end for which he was created, the reason of his immense grace on earth, the explanation of his stupendous glory in heaven. We may thus see how true the doctrine was with which we started, that his whole spiritual life, that peculiar sanctity which he shares with no other saint, was built upon and resolves itself into a most incomparably special devotion to the Eternal Father. St. Joseph's name expresses to our thoughts the shadow of the Father, and the name of the shadow of the Father leaves nothing about St. Joseph unexpressed. The apostles were a body of men unlike the rest of the saints, both in the greatness of their gifts, the magnitude of their office, and the special relation in which they stood to our blessed Lord. We may not liken the other saints to them, much less exalt any of them above the apostles of the word. Theologians teach us that we should incur the note of temerity if we did so. The litanies of the church seem to warrant us in accepting St. Joseph and St. John the Baptist. There are some of the apostles of whom we know nothing but their names as enumerated in the gospel, or some uncertain traditions of the localities of their preaching. Yet the choice of Jesus has put a golden crown upon their heads, which is an index to us not only of their rank but also of the sublimity of their holiness. We cannot doubt that the peculiarity of their office betokens a corresponding peculiarity in their grace. We look upon them with awe, and yet at the same time with a very familiar love. We see them always by the side of Jesus, and there they look so little that we hardly estimate their proportions justly. We see them also in the very process of being made the great saints they were, and their infirmities endear them to us without degrading them. We are told little of them as saints. We only or chiefly know them as novices, and even so, how wonderful they look, how wonderful and yet how human too. Hence it is that devotion to the apostles is a very affectionate devotion of the same kind, though far higher in degree, as that which we feel to the patriarchs of the Old Testament. When the church desires especially to honor a saint, it calls him, though in a lower sense, an apostle, as it called St. Philip Neri, the Apostle of Rome. But their peculiar office and peculiar grace implies also a peculiar devotion, and we cannot but believe that devotion to the Eternal Father was their special and characteristic devotion. They were brought up in the school of Jesus. He himself was their master. The spirit of Jesus was their spirit. They were formed upon it. It rested upon them. It transformed them at last into itself. When they went forth to preach, it was the living spirit of Jesus which from the narrow confines of Judea broke forth and inundated the whole heathen world. But we have seen that the spirit of Jesus was a special devotion to the Eternal Father. His spirit was the energy of that uncreated spirit, whose change in our hearts is shown by the cry of Abba, Father. Who can doubt, then, that a special devotion to the Father was also the characteristic devotion of the Apostles? We may legitimately infer it from our Lord's teaching, which we have already considered, from their special and privileged knowledge of Jesus as his apostles, which knowledge the Father alone could teach them, 
and also from the fact that imitation of their master was the distinctive genius of the members of the apostolic college. But instances of individual apostles will supply us with something more than inferences. In the case of St. Peter, we have the Eternal Father acting in an apparent independence of Jesus, and, as we should say, except for the science of our Lord, without his privity, and becoming, in secret, St. Peter's master in the theology of our Lord's divinity. St. Peter's magnificence is so broad that what seem single incidents are lost and confounded in the whole. But supposing such an event to have happened to any of the greatest saints, should we not have considered it tantamount to his whole life, to his whole vocation, to his whole sanctity? It would have coloured everything about him. It would have been the master fact of his life, taking up to itself and calling round it and subordinating all other facts. We should seem to have expressed ourselves feebly if we had merely said that henceforth devotion to the first person of the Holy Trinity had become his special devotion. In the case of St. John, his gospel furnishes us with indirect testimony of this special devotion, particularly in the conversations which he selects, doubtless under Mary's guidance, to record, for in inspiration the Holy Ghost animates and presides over the natural bias of the writer, rather than supplants or supersedes it. But, above all, his devotion to the eternal generation of our Lord is in itself most ample proof of his devotion to the Father, because the mystery in question is inseparably linked with it. In his epistles it is gleaming out perpetually, like the light through the chinks of a secret chamber. He calls Jesus the life eternal which was with the Father. He declares Jesus to us that we may have fellowship with the Father, he writes unto the babes because they have known the Father. His consolation, if we sin, is that we have an advocate with the Father. He says if we love the world, the charity of the Father is not in us, and that the pride of life is not of the Father. Antichrist is he who denies the Father and the Son, and the horror of denying the Son is that then we have not the Father, while he who confesses the Son has the Father also, and we are to abide in the Son and in the Father. That we should be the sons of God is the manner of charity which the Father hath bestowed upon us. We are to walk in the truth, he tells the elect lady, as we have received a commandment from the Father, and that he who continues in the doctrine, the same hath both the Father and the Son. St. Philip's devotion to the Father is revealed in his speech to our Lord, which we have already commented on at length, but which we must not omit to remember in the present connection. It is perhaps the most striking, as it is certainly the most touching, of all the instances of this apostolic devotion. It has certainly been enough to give to many of us an intense personal devotion to this dear apostle himself. The same devotion is quite one of the most distinguishing characteristics of St. Paul. He names the Eternal Father forty times in his different epistles, and sometimes seems to go out of his way to do it. He repeatedly blesses him in outbursts of the love of praise and of congratulation. Except the one to the Hebrews, he begins all his epistles with the formula Grace to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. In the beginning of the first epistle to the Thessalonians, he merely says Grace be to you and peace, but in the next verse speaks of their enduring in the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ before God and our Father. In the two epistles to St. Timothy, he slightly but touchingly varies the formula, adding mercy between grace and peace. And in the conclusion of the epistle to the Hebrews, he alludes to the Father and to the peace of the Father when he implores a blessing on them from the God of peace, who brought again from the dead the great pastor of the sheep, our Lord Jesus Christ, in the blood of the everlasting testament. Indeed, the practice of some holy men in making genuflections many times a day in honor of the Eternal Father was based upon that passage of St. Paul in the third chapter to the Ephesians. For this cause I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom all paternity in heaven and earth is named. There are indications of this apostolic devotion which have been allowed to transpire. Who will not see that they are indications of much more which has been hidden from us, and also that what is left us is enough. The great hearts of the apostolic college were moulded by the chosen devotion of the sacred heart, devotion to the eternal Father. 
The first person of the Holy Trinity is the Father of the angels, as well as our Father, although he is our Father in an additional sense, because of his Son having assumed our nature. Were we sufficiently instructed in the bright worships of those glorious eldest born of God, we might doubtless trace some devotion amongst them analogous to this of ours. Their amazing science of the Holy Trinity will furnish them with intelligent varieties of praise and congratulation to the divine persons which surpass our skill and comprehension. There is reason to believe that one whole choir of the angels, that of the thrones, is in some special manner devoted to the worship and science of the Father. The world of the saints supplies us also with instances of this devotion. But we must remember that there is much which lies too deep for instances. Devotion to the Father is the groundwork of a vast amount of peculiar sanctity which never reveals on its surface the nature of the ground beneath. It is, moreover, just the devotion to keep itself secret and invisible, the more so as the instruments on which it makes its music are the mysteries of the sacred humanity. It will almost always be found that any soul which is remarkable for a more than common devotion to the sacred humanity will also be distinguished by a more silent and deeper-seated, yet not the less intense, devotion to the Eternal Father. The same may be said of those who have a special devotion to St. Joseph, the school of French piety in the 17th century, of which we may take as the representative Father Condren, the general of Cardinal Burel's orations, moulded itself on the spirit of Jesus with a view to the revival of the ecclesiastical spirit, and, as might have been expected, the writings and lives of its members are full of indications of a special devotion to the Father. Among the canonized saints we find St. Aloysius, keeping every Monday holy in honor of the Eternal Father. St. Mectildus was told by our Lord to adopt as a peculiar devotion the offering of his praises to the Eternal Father. St. Lutgard was instructed by him to address especially to the Eternal Father her prayers for those in mortal sin. Noé, in his preface to his Conduct of Souls, tells us that the Jesuit, Father Ferdinand Monroy, used to go about the house exclaiming, Ardenter diligamus, patrem eternum. Let us ardently love the Eternal Father. Of all the modern saints, St. Ignatius appears to be the most distinguished by a special devotion to the Eternal Father. The inspiration to found his order came in some special way from the Father, and was the Father's gift to the Son. The whole history of it reminds us of the Father's revelation to St. Peter in the Gospel. The wonderful fragments of St. Ignatius's journal given in Bartoli's life of him, also contain some interesting traces of this dominant devotion of the saint. Doubtless a little reference to the lives of the saints would enable us to multiply these instances, but this is enough for our purpose. We have traced the devotion down from our blessed Lord, through his mother, St. Joseph, the apostles, and the saints, not without a suspicion of it among the angels, and we have landed ourselves amid these simple practices which are not above the attainments of the lowest of us. But something should be said of the grounds of this devotion, what it rests upon, what it involves, and what spirit it brings along with it. It is based on the distinct person of the Father. It is He who, without precedence, is the first of the Holy Trinity, He who is the fountain of Godhead to the Son and also with the Son to the Holy Ghost, he who is unbegotten, he who alone of all the three cannot be sent on any mission, he who is the chief symbol to us of the invisibility of the Godhead, he who is every moment begetting his eternal Son, he from whom, with the Son, the Holy Ghost is every moment eternally proceeding, he who is clothed in the mantle of all paternities, like the splendor of shot gold, wherein are curiously, inextricably wrought the fatherhoods of heaven, with the fatherhoods of earth. It is he, it is his distinct person, who is the base of our devotion, the object of our adoring love, a love specially expressed by this devotion. What he is to us, his creatures, as our Father, flows from his person. As he is the fountain of Godhead to the Son and the Holy Ghost, so is he, in a preeminent sense, the fountain of creation, redemption and sanctification to us. He is to us, and here opens a wide, indeed an illimitable field for our devotion, the giver and sender of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was he who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to die for our sins. 
It is he who, to our jubilee, has constituted himself the teacher of the grandeurs of Jesus to all of us. It is he who has made the road to himself to be, through Jesus, the pleasantest of homeward-leading paths. It is he who will cast out none who come to him by Jesus. It is he who is himself the grand highway to Jesus. It is he who gave Mary and Joseph the gifts which made them what they are, and then gave Mary and Joseph to us. It is he who gave the kingdom to Jesus, and will one day receive it back from him, so that God may be all in all and the kingdom of Jesus, not one of time but of eternity. It is he who is one with the Son and the Holy Ghost, and will come with them into our souls and make his mansion there. It is he who, having been our Father in his love from all past eternity, will be our Father in his glory for all the eternity to come. These are the grounds which his ever-blessed person furnishes for our devotion. The sweet relationship of his paternity to us is not so much another ground of our devotion as another way of looking at it. But the consideration of it is of vital importance. There is something especially reliable or trustworthy in paternal love. Other love may seem more quickly excited, or more outwardly demonstrative, or less checkered with shades of austerity, or less chastened with fear, or less sparing in its words. But there is something ultimate in a father's love, something that cannot fail, something to be believed against the whole world. We almost attribute practical omnipotence to our father in the days of our childhood. There is always against everybody an appeal to him, whose judgment is infallible, whose decision is certain to be on our side, and who has means of his own to execute his sentences irresistibly. Fire will not burn us if he is near. The thunderbolts must turn aside when they see him. The high winds can only rock us to sleep. The rough seas are only laughing at us, and we can have them punished when we will. Nightly terrors disappear in his arms, and even ghosts from the land of death dare not pursue us there. A mother's love, dear as it is, is not a thing like this. This love is a picture of our affectionate dependence upon our Heavenly Father, for with Him we are always children, not on this side of the grave only, but on the other also. Heaven is eternal childhood in the mansion of our Father. Many children who fear their fathers will yet take liberties with them, which they will not take with their mothers. Their very fears lean upon their father as completely as their love. Thus timid and daring at once, we feel so at liberty with our Heavenly Father that it seems to us, in our weak way of conceiving things, as if we were more at home with Him than with the Word or the Holy Spirit. The Word has to be veiled in flesh that He might not frighten us with His splendor, and then the Father will take us by the hand and teach us the Word. The Holy Ghost is inexpressibly dear to us, but we are afraid of him because of the possibility of the unpardonable sin, because of his sharpness with Ananias and Sapphira, and also because we ourselves know something of the sensitiveness and jealousy of his grace. Yet the Son throws his fraternal arms of flesh around us in the embraces of his love, and the Holy Spirit is fain to nestle like a dove in the bosom of our souls. What then must be our feeling of the tenderness of the Father, to whose justice we dare to confide ourselves and our eternity, as placidly as if he could not, if he would, cut off the entail of our eternal inheritance? Words cannot tell what that word says, and sings, and shows, and works within our souls, our Heavenly Father. Indulgence is the grace of justice, and it is something more than mercy. Is indulgence, then, an attribute of the unutterably holy God? An indulgence infinitely holy, the indulgence of omnipotence, the indulgence of unspeakable justice, the indulgence of eternal love. What can be conceived more beautiful, more ravishing? Yet this is the Eternal Father. He who lives only for himself and seems to live exclusively for us. He who is adorably self-sufficient only finds his sufficiency in the poverties of our love. He will merge all his royalties in the single prerogative of his fatherhood. His length, his breadth, his depth, his height are all in his compassionate paternity. To himself, as well as to us, his paternity is enough. He will take no mission, he will fill no office, he will exercise no judgment. Parter enim non judicat quemquam. The father judgeth no one. 
He will only be to us indulgence, reward, repose, a father, a bosom, a home. O father of all fathers, the most fatherlike. O uncreated tenderness, O plenitude of paternal fondness, O dearest and most blessed person, so clearly seen, yet so adorably invisible, so very near in love, yet so far off in majesty. How can we praise thee but with our silence? How can we love thee but by the passionate confession of our impossibility to love thee worthily? Sweet babe of Bethlehem, show us the Father. It will be enough, for there is no possible more that we can crave. It will not be more than enough, for less will not content our craving. Simply, as St. Philip said, He is enough, the Father is enough. Our relationship of brothers to Jesus is very sweet and has an independent sweetness of its own, but it also opens our way deeper for us into the paternity of the Father. We are more his sons because we are the brothers of Jesus. He is more our Father on that account. The sacred humanity has glorified us all with its own excellent filiation. As in the days of Bethlehem, the Father imparted the shadows and rites of his blessed paternity mysteriously to Mary and Joseph, and thus made the region of the infancy so glorious and so heavenlike. In like manner now, he will not leave us without similar consolations. He imparts them to his priests in their relationship to our souls, and above all in respect to the blessed sacrament. It is part of our Father's love that, inside the pale of the church, earth should be one perpetual and even ubiquitous Bethlehem. The infant Jesus, the joy of the Father and our joy, is forever there, and in him the Father declared, with rare expletive, that he was well pleased. Still, on the altar and in the tabernacle, the babe of Bethlehem is increasing the glory of the Father. Still is he giving breadth and space to his Father's love by the multitude of the redeemed. Still is he furnishing his father with new opportunities of communicating his paternity to new children and in new graces. Still is the novelty of the service and the love which the father received from the babe of Bethlehem as new as ever, if not more wonderfully new, upon the altar. Still is every mass illustrating all the father's perfections in that work of his predilection, the work of abbreviating his long, eternally spoken and unbrokenly uttered word. By the Father's love we live in Bethlehem. Little Bethlehemite calvaries we find there, whereon love tenderly crucifies us, sparing more than it punishes, and punishing not to punish, but that it may more abundantly reward. To the great calvary we never go. The Father laid that only on our eldest brother. It is not for such as we are. Our homes are Bethlehem and Nazareth. We have our desert and our Egypt seasons, but only the shadow of Calvary. More than the shadow of it our Father cannot bear should fall upon us. How can we say what we feel of this benignity of our Father? We will think of Mary and yet say that when a father is indulgent, he is more indulgent than a mother. Little ones treat their mother as the authority of rule and their father as the authority of dispensation and mothers are well pleased their children should use them so, in order that they may thus childishly express the love they bear their fathers, which is all too great for their little words to hold. It is a mother's noblest joy to watch her child increasing in love of its father and in its father's love. It is easy, then, for us to discern the spirit of devotion to the Eternal Father. A few words will depict it. It is a devotion of immense tenderness. Tenderness is its leading feature. We might almost say that it is all tenderness, for no tenderness is truly tender which is not kept pure by fear. This devotion is at least the fountain of all tenderness in us, and of all blameless liberty of spirit. It is the charter of the soul. It is the fulfilling of the significancy of our creation. It is in itself the most abundant and the most unalloyed communication of the spirit of Jesus. It is the ultimate devotion, and so the devotion of devotions, the last point to which devotion can reach in its upward ascension, that which is behind and beyond all else, except it be devotion to the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity. May we dare to say it, it is in human things a sort of reverential imitation of the love of the Word and the Holy Ghost for the co-equal Father in divine things. Nay, we must dare yet again, it is also an imitation of the Father himself, eternally generating the Son by the knowledge of himself, 
and with the Son eternally breathing out the Holy Ghost as their mutual love. For it is in the knowledge and love of Him, and in union with His Son, and with the utterance of the Spirit's voice, that this devotion consists. We have begun with the bosom of the Father. We have ended at His feet. The bosom and the feet of the Father represent all mysteries. Because of the incarnate Word in His bosom, a creation is called into existence to lie forever at His feet. That part of creation, which shares the created nature of the incarnate Word, falls willfully from the Father's feet. Angels who fell are let to fall because they did not share that nature. Men, because they shared it, are brought back by the man-loving Word. He who is in the bosom comes forth, lays himself at the feet of men, wins their love, raises them by their own love-extorted permission, and lays them again, those who will permit him, in eternal safety at the Father's feet. This is the history of creation. So creation and incarnation, which might have been two mysteries, but were actually one, are expressed in these seven wonders of God's world, an incarnate word in the Father's bosom, a world modelled on him at the Father's feet, a world sharing the created nature of the Word who dwelt in the Father's bosom, a world fallen from the Father's feet, a world sought by the Word from the Father's bosom, a world reconquered and laid triumphantly at the Father's feet, the Word re-entered and dwelling ever more in His created nature in the Father's bosom. We have done. How unworldly is the spirit of the land of Bethlehem! It has led us up into the heights of the eternal Word, and down into the depths of his unfathomable abasement. There have been joy and sorrow, tears have become blood and blood tears, and then both of them smiles. The crib has glanced into the cross, and the cross melted off into the vision of the crib. Now at length the childhood of the Eternal has sweetly cast us back on the very living fountain of eternity, the first person of the most holy and undivided trinity. The eternal child and the ancient of days have come together. They are one. The babe on Mary's lap, an earthly mother's lap, has lifted us up above ourselves and has borne us swiftly and softly as a dove's flight and has laid us and left us in our old home, now a secure, everlasting home, the feet of our eternal Father. End of section 34 End of Bethlehem by Frederick William Faber